So I have two bold predictions for the upcoming months. Number one, we're gonna see a CBDC probably sometime by this summer, I would imagine, the whole Fed now thing. Second is they always roll some huge disaster out right before the elections to sway public opinion. They're gonna use some kind of event to say, oh no, we need to enact martial law. China's attacking us, cyber attacking us. Martial law, Can't have an no election. election. No. Yep, that's the only strategy because when you look at the poll numbers, it ain't looking good for Mr. Biden. BlackRock, State Street, and Vanguard own a combined combined 88% of all US stocks as of 2024. BlackRock is expected to own 60% of all single family US real estate by 2030. These are the same investment banks who are launching Bitcoin and Ethereum ETFs. This is power. This is an opportunity where a bank in 100 years could eclipse a nation state. If we're gonna shift this tectonic imbalance of wealth, it has to begin with people like you and I getting empowered with knowledge of how this game works and how we can play the game like the 1% to begin shifting that wealth back into the people's hands so that it doesn't keep going down this kind of dark road of multinational corporations owning everything. Every single system is going to fall and simultaneously be reborn. This is a real opportunity for the average person to set themselves up and their family up generationally. Welcome back, everyone, to The Great Awakening Show. My name is Aaron Abke, and this is our January update episode for 2024. I'm joined alongside my good friend, financial savant, American state national, and freedom evangelist extraordinaire, Mr. Jay Griff. How you doing, brother? <laughs> Never been intro like that. <laughs> I got to give you the good intro, man. I love it. I love it. I'm doing great. Uh, we are very excited for today's episode, guys. We're uh, we're about a week and a half into January right now, and <laughs> we've got all sorts of uh, tea to spill. So, buckle up. Yeah, we uh, we predicted this in our December 2023 episode that 2024 is shaping up to be the craziest year yet, and so far it has not disappointed. We're recording this about mid January as of now. You guys are watching this on. The first of February, and we already have like too much content to choose from. <laughs> so uh, we're going to waste no time and get right into it. Uh, we're going to start off with our first segment of the show, which is positive news. And so uh, I'll pitch it over to you, brother. What did you uh, pick out for this month's positive news? All right. So my piece of positive news is something that's much more so in my wheelhouse. There was a lot that has happened in the last two-ish weeks, but one thing that I wanted to highlight, because it's going to be kind of a probably a recurring theme today, is around the financial markets and such. So a few days ago, we had the SEC come forward and post what was apparently a fake tweet <laughs> from their account being hacked that said the Bitcoin ETF was approved. And... Then they walked it back and said, our account was hacked. We, we do not support Bitcoin or whatever it may be. So the market's, you know, going through up, down pandemonium. And the approval date for the Bitcoin ETF that we've been waiting for has been January 10th. We've been waiting for that for a long time. I'll say 40% or so of the market that, from my perspective, has been in complete disbelief. Uh, I don't know in your circles, mm -hmm. Aaron, but a lot of people are just sitting on the sidelines, not really taking this seriously and weren't actually thinking anything was going to happen on January 10th because maybe they don't have the access to behind the scenes resources and such. But it was very, very apparent to me many months ago that this was not a joke, that this was going to happen. When you see players like BlackRock get involved, it's pretty much game over. Yeah. Yeah. This is an article from yesterday from the time we're filming this January 11th. So who knows, who knows how this is going to age by the time this comes <laughs> out. But yesterday we had 11 ETFs approved wow. by the SEC. So Bitcoin I'll kind of skim the article for you guys. The S Securities and Exchange Commission said it approved 11 applications, including BlackRock, ARK Invest. So that's Kathy Woods. All my students will be very familiar with her. 
Uh, Fidelity, Invesco, Vanek, despite warnings from some officials and investor advocates that the products carried risks. So this is massive. Obviously, if you're like deep in crypto or you're an OG in crypto, the last thing you want is government involvement in crypto. The last thing you want is big banks involved in it. It's kind of an oxymoron, right? Those two things don't go together. Right. Having said that, we can't control that. So as an investor, all you can really do is front run the whales and capitalize off of their greed, essentially, right? And their agendas. So for the average person, this is a massive opportunity because what's about to happen now is the media industrial complex, one of the, I'll say the biggest propaganda machine in the world, is about to funnel all of its intention and attention and resources at marketing and creating propaganda campaigns to get the mainstream to buy their products. Mm -hmm. And their products are going to be Bitcoin ETFs. For those of you who aren't very familiar with what that means or what ETFs are, that's an exchange traded fund. Basically think of it as a centralized company owns a basket of assets or a select asset class, and they own it for you and then you buy into their ETF product, which is a separate product from the underlying asset, and you get to benefit from the price action of the asset, but you don't actually own the asset. Wow. Having said that, I would never recommend any of you listening to this (laughs) buy these products, but that isn't the point of why this is such good news. This is a revolutionary day because this is the first asset class in our lifetime that stands a real chance at replacing the fiat-based monetary system that we've been dealing with since 1913, right? Most of our listeners will be aware that our dollar has been devalued about 32 times since 1913 with the creation of the Federal Reserve. And so, of course, you know, all of us, you know, we talk about metals, gold and silver, but how realistic is that in this day and age, right? Yeah. Something like Bitcoin comes along, it solves these problems. It has inherent caps to its supply. And now what you're seeing is a massive, massive boost in demand. They're anticipating about 50 billion in inflows in the next two years. What's important to understand about this whole thing is is not that I'm a proponent of the ETF itself. I would never buy it. It's not that. As an investor, all you're looking at is demand and supply, basically. And demand is about to skyrocket. When you have everyone and their mother talking about Bitcoin, every news station promoting Bitcoin, because these companies, the Black Rocks, the Van X, the Fidelities, they're going to put an ungodly amount of spend advertising spend behind marketing these products because the way that these companies work if you're not familiar with ever buying into a hedge fund or an etf or an index fund they charge you a percentage that could be 0.5 percent it could be five percent but they charge you an annual percentage to invest your money for you that's how they make their money they don't charge you to use the product they take a percentage of your total lump sum that you put into the product to invest with them. And that's APY? Kind of. So basically, their business model is getting as many customers as possible using their products because they're going to get a tiny percentage of that. And it's essentially a race, right? Because there is a limited amount of Bitcoin. No more will ever be created in existence. Mm -hmm. And you have people like Michael Saylor trying to buy up 1% of the entirety of Bitcoin. And now that the banks and, you know, the powers that be, if you will, are entering the race, it's basically going to be a situation where whoever buys up the most Bitcoin is going to be able to offer the the largest amount of customers an opportunity to buy from their Bitcoin ETF, if that makes sense. In other words, You can't have an amount of customers buying into your Bitcoin ETF that exceeds the amount of Bitcoin that you yourself hold on your books. So they have to first buy it. This is part of what the SEC regulated. They have to actually hold it, unlike fractional reserve banking, right? Mm -hmm. They have to hold the underlying amount, and then you buy that amount in paper. You don't actually own it. 
that's a whole other issue. That's why I don't recommend buying it. But uh, so this is going to be a ridiculous catalyst. And as we head into 2024, 2025, we have the Bitcoin having in a few months, uh, things are going to get crazy. So, oh, that's right. Maybe this isn't a, uh, you know, stereotypical like uh, a kitty was saved from a tree piece of positive <laughs> news. But if you understand the financial markets like I do, this is revolutionary. This is the yeah. first real opportunity for the average everyday person to number one, this is just history to, you know, be a part of history. But number two, this is the fairest system we've had proposed in our lifetime By and far. really in the last hundred years. Mm -hmm. So this is up there with the creation of the Federal Reserve. What's happening right now is an, a serious fight for power and regulators were kind of caught off guard and they had their hand forced. The SEC did not want to approve this. They got to a point where the big dogs who are more powerful than them, the Black Rocks, the Vanguards, came in and were like, this is going to happen. Do your job. Yeah. And up until that moment, the SEC was not even willing to consider this stuff. So very interesting. Your average everyday person who, you know, may not have been paying attention to this, they're going to really start to pay attention to this and they're going to feel strong FOMO in the coming months yeah. as, you know, the price continues to go up and as your Uber drivers talking about it and as your grandma's talking about it and all these types of things. <laughs> This is, you know, what what I do for a living and what we do for our students. The point is you front run the whales. You're in long before the whales get in. And when a whale jumps in a pool, there's a massive tidal wave, right? And you ride that wave. Surf that wave. So that's what we do. It's an exciting time to be alive. This is something that, yeah. once again, would not happen in a first turning, a second turning, or a third turning. Mm -hmm. This is another sign, just like so many of the things we're going to go into today, of a fourth turning. Mm -hmm. This is a shift, a societal shift, a systemic shift in the way that value is thought of, transferred, and stored. And if you can really sit with what I just said, that is a massive idea because you can't just come out overnight and say hey you know those things you have in your wallet that you call dollars yeah those don't actually have any value we're not using them anymore yeah instead we're going to use seashells people can't just shift their ideologies overnight on what they consider to have value it took many 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 years for people to start to believe that the fiat currency had value so it also, on the inverse of that, t is going to take many years for people to shift out of fiat and view other things as having value. Mm -hmm. And we're in the middle of seeing a societal shift where, you know, a few years ago, people would not touch Bitcoin. It was going to zero. BlackRock was the biggest proponent of that with all of their articles about how it, it had no underlying value as a trash asset. They wouldn't touch it with a 10 foot pole. Meanwhile, they were buying it behind the scenes. Welcome to the game. <laughs> Once they allocated enough, now they turn on the marketing machine and they want you to pump their bags. Yeah. So this is just the way that it is. But what's exciting for me as, you know, a fan of innovation and a student of, you know, all things really innovation and, and societal change. What's fascinating for me is the implications of a society in which we have an actual sound money that can't be manipulated. You can't expand the supply of Bitcoin. As a matter of fact, every halving, the supply gets cut. So what's about to happen in April when we have the next Bitcoin halving? And that reduces the sell pressure on Bitcoin. And simultaneously, we have dozens of ETFs now funneling tens of billions in ad spend to get everyone to buy their products. You do the math. So it's an exciting time. That's my piece of uh, that's my piece of news. And you guys can check out, you know, any of these articles. As I said, you know, we have certain analysts talking about 55 billion over five years. We have other analysts talking about 50 to 100 billion this year alone. So regardless of, you know, where you stand, this is going to be an astronomical influx like we have never seen. And I want to clarify the difference and why this is a generational opportunity and isn't the same as talking about any other trend in our lifetime. 
here's the one difference. When you're talking about a stock, when you're talking about a fiat currency, when you're talking about any other trend, there is not a finite supply. I don't know how much our audience knows about the stock market, but all you have to do is go through a stock split or print more shares and you devalue your investors, right? Mm -hmm. So if a company started out and there were 100,000 underlying shares to start with, as that company grows in value, they do something that basically devalues the investors, but it's, it's considered commonplace in the stock market. They will expand the amount of shares. So if you were an initial holder and your shares were worth a certain amount, now they're worth a little bit of less. They get diluted basically over time. And the same thing with a, with a fiat currency. They print it, they print it, they print it. This is fundamentally different. Even gold, we consider that to have intrinsic value, but gold is mined from the earth and we haven't excavated all of it, have we? So there's not even as strong of a finite supply of gold or silver Great because point. they can just go mine more. The only reason gold has inherent scarcity is because it requires a lot of resources and it's not easy to mine gold. That's the only reason. Bitcoin has a certain amount in existence and it will never have an additional amount past that. That is a revolutionary idea. And so we don't have the mathematics or the experience to wrap our head around what the price action implications of that are going to be. So exciting time. Buckle up. If you are not allocated at all into crypto, you have you know very little about it. Now would be the time to uh, to dive in at the very least. Wink, and wink. if you are... Congrats, uh, <laughs> those of us who who try to be, uh, you know, more of the early movers in the know. Um, it's gonna be a, it's gonna be a wild ride. Yep. Um, can you scroll up to the top of this article? There was one line that I thought was amusing. The SEC said it approved eleven applications, including BlackRock, etc., despite warnings from some officials and investor advocates that products, it's these products carry risks. It's like, that's because they were shitting all over cryptocurrency for so many years. And now they're like, Hey, buy crypto through us. And so they have to yeah. be like, well, you know, it is risky. We weren't totally lying earlier. It's like, Oh, cause stocks aren't risky. Any investment isn't risky. <laughs> Bitcoin's uniquely risky, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it's one of those things where that it's kind of hilarious. The sec, when they did finally approve it, literally put out a statement, Gary Gensler clarifying that this does not mean that we support or <laughs> recommend Bitcoin. We're just approving the Bitcoin ETF. It's like, wait, what, what sense does that make? They're like, we wish we didn't have to do this, but we know y'all are going to buy Bitcoin. And so we want to control it as much as possible. Literally, it's like a tail between the legs Tell us yeah. you're owned by BlackRock without telling us you're owned by BlackRock. <laughs> Do you think that the the weird fake tweet thing that happened was like a purposeful market manipulation strategy or did they really get hacked? So that's interesting because we have like senators and everything. I don't know if you saw that, but multiple uh, congressmen, senators calling for a, a legit investigation into that because if any other company person influential figure did that they would be experiencing serious repercussions right but the ones who are supposed to keep us safe in the financial markets are the ones who manipulated the market right there right uh, i saw some stats that uh 100 billion in uh call options got wiped out from that so like that's that's a lot of people's you know, you're playing around with a lot of people's uh, wealth when you're doing things like that, manipulating the market, causing it to flush down and such. Um, you know, the longer you've been in the market, it's just another day in the market. But at the right. same time, you can't you can't downplay something like that. So, yeah, I think that I think that that was scheduled for the next day and uh, someone basically dropped the ball <laughs> and posted it early. Otherwise, you know, there's some more conspiratorial theories, but I'll go with that as my base case. I just think uh, the ball was dropped. It was posted early. And yeah. then it's like, you know, at that point, you might as well say it's approved because it was the day before 
we already saw what they were going to say. They yeah. just had to walk it back because it was a little early or whatever it may be. So yeah. it's been interesting. And it'll also be interesting to uh, track this. By the time this episode comes out, a lot will have transpired. So <laughs> hopefully hopefully this ages well. Let us know in the comments. Uh, nothing catastrophic happens. Yeah. Well, let me try to put what you just said in layman's terms for the uh, economic neophyte like myself to understand. <laughs> You're talking about banks. You know, we don't have real money in our society. It's all fake money. Meaning when you go to the bank, you deposit a hundred dollar bill into your bank account. You think the bank is storing that hundred dollars for you, but actually it's literally disappearing into the ATM, never to be seen by you again. And the bank's giving yep. you credit into your account. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, it looks fine to you. Cause then a hundred dollars of credit shows up in your account. But if the bank were to fail that day, you ain't getting that hundred dollars back. Yep. It's there. So it's really like a loan you're giving the bank. That's the way they see it is a loan. This is why they want to make all money digital and they want to make money as ethereal as possible, right? So they can control it. And we're going to get into that more later with the CBDC stuff. But this is why Bitcoin is such a financial revolution, because as you were saying, and explaining Bitcoin, there is a finite amount, there is a limited amount. And when you have Bitcoin, you actually hold it right on your wallet, on your ledger. And nobody else can get it from you because it has a certain QR code type of thing. Um, what do they call those long links to your wallet? It's a transaction block. ID. Yeah, you have a long transaction ID that's attached to your blockchain wallet that only you have access to, right? So you actually are owning that asset, that digital asset. And so the, uh, the big whales and the big banks and investment corporations don't like that because they can't control your asset anymore. So what they've essentially done with Bitcoin, I've heard, um, I think it was Michael Saylor describing Bitcoin like a Trojan horse into the financial yep. system because mm -hmm. it's this nuclear asset that just, like it's the number one asset over the last decade by far, the top performing asset in the world. And so obviously anyone who wants to make money likes to find what the top performing asset is. So it's, it's impossible for those financial elites to resist investing in something that's blowing up like Bitcoin does every couple of years. And so it's yep. a Trojan horse in that sense that even the biggest institutions won't be able to resist investing in it. And yes. that's kind of when the Trojan horse will become unleashed and the virus gets disseminated into the economic system where everyone's going to want to start using Bitcoin now because we're yep. watching our government inflate the dollar by the day. Bitcoin's not getting inflated. It can't be inflated. So people are going to yep. eventually pick up the logic here and start using cryptocurrencies, probably most notably Bitcoin. And so the big whales don't want you to actually own that Bitcoin. They want to own as much of it as possible and make these ETFs where they say, hey, don't buy Bitcoin yourself. Invest in our Bitcoin that we will take the risk for you and you can just, you know, make profits off of it percentage wise and, and all will be well. And it looks good to those who don't maybe understand the game at the level that you understand it, Jeremy, because they're like, oh, cool, less risk. I get to play in the Bitcoin market. Awesome. But again, it's not your Bitcoin. It's their Bitcoin. And so yeah. there's a lot of drawbacks that come with that. So the, the Trojan horse is already taking effect, as you kind of explained, in that these investment uh, companies can't resist uh, investing in it. And so now the SEC is forced to approve it because BlackRock and State Street have them under the, the arm, right? Under the, by the head. <laughs> and yeah. so they, they kind of like have forced their hand. And if we fast forward five or 10 years, we could be looking at a world where, you know, 80, 90% of people or something like that are actually using Bitcoin on a daily basis uh, to do transactions with. And that would be a, a much more fair economic system than the current one we're living under. Yep. Yeah. It's going to be a fundamental shift from, you know, the swift banking system where if you want to send an international wire, not only are you paying, let's say $35, but you're having to wait two to three business days versus right. you send some Bitcoin and it's there in 20 minutes and it's cheaper. So yeah, there is no comparison. Yep. <laughs> it's just going to take some time because like I said, the idea of what money is and what value is and how it's transacted, it you can't just change that concept overnight in your mind. It, it takes people repetition and some time. Yeah. I want to give it a, an analogy real quick before we move on. Most of our audience should be familiar with the fact that BlackRock is buying up all of the real estate and that essentially their agenda is that you will own nothing right? <laughs> and you'll enjoy it. So you're going to rent from BlackRock in the future if you know if you don't get your shit together. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's a message to us all, right? So 
the same way that BlackRock wants to buy up all of the real estate and have you rent from them, you're right. still going to have shelter, but you're going to not have ownership, aka control of your own destiny, right? This is exactly what is happening right now. They recognize the opportunity. They cannot pass it up. The risk of being not involved is way higher than the risk of being involved. Right. That's important. Now that that's the case, they're all racing to jump in the pool. They are going to swallow up all of the remaining supply. And for the next however many hundred years we use cryptocurrencies for as a method of store of value and transfer of value, they are going to own it and you're going to lease it. That's what the ETF is. And you'll be it's happy. It's the same playbook and you'll be happy with your uh, crickets and, and bugs. And Eating such. the bugs. The same exact playbook, yeah. right? So in the sovereignty space and in some of my content, um, I talk a lot about, and we hear this notion in the space in general about, you know, ownership versus control. And, you know, this is where it's kind of the same concept as why you want to have, for example, trust set up and why you don't want things in your personal name and such, right? Like the name of the game, if you're going for power, freedom, sovereignty, et cetera, is to control things, right? Mm -hmm. And usually that means you have to be the trustee with a fiduciary obligation over said thing. Same with this stuff. Crypto and Bitcoin is revolutionary because it is one of the first assets that you can actually control and own. Like when you buy a stock, you don't get mailed a, a stock certificate in the mail anymore. Right. You don't actually own a percentage of that company. You just own numbers on a screen. You own a representation of that. When you get money, you don't actually have any money. You have a representation of money in your wallet. This is different. That's worth studying. I had to say that again because it's it's fundamentally so simple that people might overlook it. Yeah. We but do. if you studied the last, you know, 500,000 years of civilizations, this is a really big deal. An extremely big deal. So, we'll move on from that. Yeah. That's my piece. Would love to hear your piece, Aaron. What I was pretty certain that was going to be your positive news after yesterday's news came out. <laughs> Um, so I got something very different, but equally positive. This is a clip from Tucker Carlson. I'm just going to play it for you. What, can you describe what's happening and then tell us why you think it is? Hi, Tucker. Yes. Well, thank you for having me because uh, what you said is correct. A lot of media are absolutely ignoring the massive protests that are going on right now in Germany. Uh, as you know, I'm from the Netherlands and we uh, we are neighboring countries to uh, to Germany. And I've been very involved in the protests of the farmers over in my home country. And when I heard that the German farmers were going out to protest, I thought to myself, I need to be there. The reason the German farmers are protesting right now um, is actually because a decision by the German government sparked a lot of anger. Uh, the German government has decided to uh, to basically eliminate a tax break on agricultural diesel. And that's not just, you know, the only thing that they've done in the past few years to uh, to attack and basically harass the, the German farmers. The German farmers are subjected just like the Dutch farmers and a lot of farmers around the Western world uh, to all sorts of new regulations and restrictions all of the time. And quite frankly, they they feel unheard. They feel unwanted. They feel like they are being uh, harassed off of their land, basically. And they are sick and tired of feeling like they have no right to exist. And so the German farmers have announced huge protests and those have started on Monday with uh, massive roadblocks nationwide. And this is a, a protest that we haven't seen um, in this type of in this type of magnitude in Germany ever before. So, so I pulled that clip out because right now for the last six months, probably Europe has been erupting with protests, especially farmers. And this is, of course, not something you've heard a peep about on mainstream media. Yep. But if you pay attention to independent journalists who've been reporting on this, we had like the Dutch farmers went off a few months ago, massive nationwide protests. 
We had Canadian farmers, Ireland, Irish protesters, uh, farmers protesting. There was a big protest in New Zealand. We, you know, we saw the Canadian trucker convoy a few years ago. Um, these these pro these mass organized protests are starting to erupt all over the place, and you only aren't hearing about it because you're not going to hear about it on mainstream outlets. But this is a such a positive sign for humanity, because yes, it's still that fighting energy. That's not the most ideal way to approach this. But nevertheless, it's a step in the right direction because any step towards unity at this point is a positive step for humanity. And these kinds of mass organized protests reveal that in the collective consciousness right now, there is an awakening to our power of unity and an awakening to the insidious levels of corruption being domineered over us by the elites in the world and a necessity to begin standing up to that and saying, no, we're not going to participate in this anymore. And so, of course, you know, if you watched the rabbit hole series that we did last year, then you already know that what's really has happened in the world is that everything has been sort of corporatized and companies are engaging, well, governments, companies, institutions are engaging in like war and enslavement through business, right? Because they get us to sign these contracts that we don't know are contracts, driver's license, opening an LLC, even your birth certificate. They're getting humans under contracts to say, yeah, I'm your, I'm your corporate employee, United States citizen, all capitals. And so, yeah, I, I work for you. Now, you, you don't know that you've, uh, you've said that. You don't know that you've signed an agreement to that, but you have. And so I'm not exactly sure how it works in Germany, in the Netherlands and Ireland, but I'm pretty sure it works almost identically everywhere, where it's the fact that these corporations through the government, even the government's a corporation, have gotten these farmers, these small businesses, you know, under so many contracts that they can just say, hey, we're getting rid of your right to do X, Y, Z. We're going to tax you for this. We're going to tax you for that. And of course, under a sovereign rule of law, that's impossible that they could ever do such a thing to just pluck away the rights of farmers like that. But that's the world we live in because this veil's been pulled over our eyes. And it's really amazing to me, Jeremy, how even all the independent news outlets, journalists that I watch, even the top you know, independent uh, journalists in the world, Tucker Carlson, Russell Brand, Tim Poole, it's like literally nobody seems to get this of how they pull this off, of how they're doing this, right? It's through these corporate, through the corporate veil of getting everyone under contracts where they've signed their rights away without knowing it. And now we're no longer operating under a republic form of government, but a corporate admiralty maritime system where they have all the power. And so while it's great to see these massive protests of farmers and tractors blocking the highways for hundreds of miles, it shows a lot of unity coming together. There's a much easier way that hopefully humanity will begin figuring out, which is to kill these contracts and opt out of our contracts and begin operating in the private which is what you teach so much about. And I think like whenever there's enough like anger and animosity from the abuse that's been uh, experienced by humanity, people start to finally dig deeper. And the, they ask those important questions of like, how are they getting away with this? How can they just take away our rights to farm organically and whatnot and just tell us what to do or throw us in prison? That doesn't feel right. And then they start to figure out following the breadcrumb trail that, yeah, that's because it's not right. It's because everything's been inverted over the last hundred some odd years. And that's kind of one of the problems, right? Is that humans don't live super long. And so if, if a takeover like this happens in a 150 year time span, but most people are living 60, 70 years, we were all born into this. It was normal to us to sign a birth certificate and all that stuff. So we have to really, like you say, do our research and history and say, hey, when did this whole system start? And what did life look like before this system? And then the puzzle pieces start coming together. Mm. Yeah, you're giving me a lot to talk about. <laughs> a lot I want to say about that. But this notion of uh, you just nailed it with this notion of first off, humans are very short term thinkers. Second yeah. off, you're right. The average lifespan is, you know, around 70, 75 years. If you're born into something and it was just like this when you were born into it, a lot of people aren't going to question that. You can't see it. Let's take that a step further. What is the matrix? Well, it's a siphoning of your energy and your consciousness at the most macro level, right? 
go above finances, above food, above health care, above media, above war. It's a siphoning of your energy, your life force, your consciousness. And so we live in this system where most people can't get out of the lower levels of consciousness and you can't possibly entertain the types of questions that we're talking about right now. Why the hell are you going to ask these types of questions when you don't know how you're about to pay your rent in two weeks? Yeah. And you don't have enough money if your transmission were to go out on your 17 year old car to replace that. So you're just fingers crossed, right? And you're just trying to get by. And this is something that I think about a lot because there's really two worlds. There's two worlds that people live in, right? And they're polar opposite. And so I think that's, you know, I can speak for both of us when I say that that's a huge driving force in the work that we both do in the world. You do it from a, a spirituality and a easing suffering lens. And I do it from more of a uh, financial and a a little bit more of a 3D lens, but we're both doing the same thing and driven by the same why in that sense. Yeah. So many people are unable to ask these kinds of questions, let alone do anything about them, right? And I've come to experience in my own journey, for example, when I was like head down, not where I want to be, you know, in debt, living with my mom, I was up against a lot, right? At least that was in my mind, I was. I had a long way to go. You can only ask so deep of questions when you haven't yet met your basic human needs. Mm -hmm. And then as you start to shift and advance yourself in life, you reach financial, let's say, comfortability. Then you reach financial independence. Then you reach financial freedom. That's the system's worst nightmare because now you have nothing but time, resources, and influence to think about these problems and do something about them. And to me, that is the culmination and the connection between your work and my work, which is that both of these things matter. You need yep. to have the consciousness and the heart to serve humanity and to see that there is something seriously wrong with the way that this planet is operating. But you also need the resources, the wealth, the financial literacy, the legal literacy to do something about it. Mm -hmm. So that's what, you know, that's some of what comes to mind when I watch that. Like, you know, we both have the same stances on protests, you know, not going to do much. But at the same time, what that is a sign of is a fourth turning, people being fed up, people people doing something about it. And they're at least, no pun intended, marching in the right direction, <laughs> right? <laughs> Eventually, if you continue down that path, asking the right questions, demanding answers, you might stumble upon a real solution that's a little more uh, sturdy than, you know, protesting or trying to block streets. Right. Yeah, your point's super valid, man, that the physical and the spiritual have to be balanced and integrated together. You can't just have one without the other or you're imbalanced still. And, you know, this is one of the plans of the negative polarity, the controllers of the planet is that they want to keep humanity like constantly drinking from a fire hose of problems and mm -hmm. chaos, right? As long as they can keep humanity drowning in problems and travesties and calamities, then everyone's just in survival mode, which means they're not going to be asking the important questions of why is everything exactly. going wrong? Why is life so hard? Does it need to be this way? You don't have the luxury of asking those questions when you're trying to keep your head above the water, right? Mm -hmm. And that's why Bitcoin is a net positive. That's why these kinds of global protests are a big positive because it shows people are waking up to this. And if there's another vaccine mandate, if there's another whatever the next mandate is, these global protests are showing me signs that humanity is still continuing to wake up even after COVID has ended. And I think whatever it is they roll out next, and we're going to talk about what that may be in a second, there's going to be a much bigger, no, thank you. We do not consent kind of response from humanity. And it's only going to keep going in that direction. J yep. Just like the Vax mandate, I think was a big wake up call for the controllers of our planet. 
because they didn't think they were, they were going to get 30 to 40% of people saying, no, I won't take your job. They probably thought it was going to be like 10%. And they're like, no problem. We'll just throw those people in jail and call them terrorists and move on. And it didn't work out that way, right? So this yeah. is a positive sign that we're continuing to wake up to the, the plans and the strategies of the controllers. And the divine intelligence will continue to filter into humanity as we more and more wake up to this those more helpful and effective perspectives like common law and sovereignty that will really begin to liberate humanity. Amen. So do we want to move on to our second segment of the show? Yeah, let's move into our second segment, which is reaction clips now. And um, I want to give a quick preface, Jeremy, before we get into these reaction clips. You know, the, again, the purpose of this show, the Great Awakening show, is to empower the listener with positive enlightened perspectives, encouraging perspectives on this great awakening that's happening and sort of like global news that, as we know, 99% of all news headlines in the world are negatively oriented. But here we're giving you that 1%. We're going to give you the, the light side perspective of things. And sometimes that requires us to get really integrated in understanding the strategies of the dark side because you can only know the light by the dark, right? Most people today, Jeremy, are living in this assumption or belief that we're, we live in a purely physical universe. It's just physical objects, that's all. There's no underlying forces behind the physical events that happen. It's all just you know inert matter happening randomly. But of course, this is emphatically not the case because we live in a spiritual universe, which is to say a metaphysical universe. Uh, beyond the physical. Those who've risen to power in our planet are people that could not have done so unless they understand these metaphysics, these natural laws that govern the universe, and they use these laws to their advantage, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the laws of karma, uh, the law of cause and effect, the law of attraction. They sow seeds of fear in through the mainstream media to keep everybody in a fear state so they can keep us on the puppet strings, right? These are basic strategies that the negative polarity uses. And so they use all of these laws to their advantage because they know most people are unconsciously ignorant of them. And that gives them a position of power, right? So for us as, as a collective to wake up to how these metaphysical laws work is the greatest thing we can do to empower ourselves to stand in the light and then see the darkness from the light and say, no, thank you. We're not going to play that game anymore. If we don't see the laws of the universe as they are and how they work, then we'll keep falling ignorantly into their traps, right? And so this preface I'm giving you is to say that in today's episode, we're going to talk a bit about sort of what we expect, what we may expect to see from these controllers on our planet, what their next steps may look like. But this is in no way... To, to give a kind of like fearful or dark perspective of what's happening in the world, it's, it should always feel like a very empowering thing when we start to understand the chess game that's being played on the highest level because that chess game is all surrounding metaphysical laws, natural laws that God put in place. And so if chess is our analogy, the rules of chess, right? Which piece can do what and so forth, um, how you win the game, checkmate, this and that. Those represent the metaphysical laws of the universe. So if you think about how you would need to go about telling somebody what you're going to do before you do it, then you can start to understand how the game is played. We talked about this all through the rabbit hole series. I think we touched on this, Jeremy, in our last episode, that because of the laws of karma, those controllers, they can't just malevolently steamroll over humanity however they want because they create negative karma that comes back on them because the universe works on balance. So they've learned over time, probably over thousands of years of doing this, that they have to somehow give a tell to the public of what they're going to do because then they get your free will involved and they avoid the karmic consequences because even silence is a form of acquiescence under metaphysical law. If somebody tells you what they're going to do and you don't give your free will to say, no, I'm not interested in that, then you are by way sort of consenting to that and they get to alleviate the negative karma they would otherwise attract. So if you think about if you were them, how would you have to go about telling someone what you're about to do to them <laughs> before you do it? 
then you, you come to the conclusion pretty quick that there's really just one possible way that you could do that without giving yourself away. The, the wolf in sheep's clothing, right? Is that you would have to pretend like the things you're about to do to them are not being caused by you, but are coming from somewhere else. And hence we have, you know, Klaus Schwab, Bill Gates, Joe Biden, who've been saying for many months now, we fear that there's going to be a coming cyber attack from Iran, from Russia, from China. You notice they always blame it on our adversaries that, oh, Iran's planning this cyber attack. First of all, how would you know if your adversary was planning a cyber attack? <laughs> That's not how the art of war works. <laughs> but it's like, you see how the game is played? Oh, oh, there's a big bad thing coming. Look over there. They're the ones who are going to do it. And then while you look over there, I take the money out of your back pocket. This is the chief strategy, right? So Jesus's admonition in the gospels to be as wise as serpents, but as innocent as doves is very um, poignant advice for our times because the positive path is like a dove. It's innocent. It's pure. But the negative path is like a serpent, you know, cunning and wise and tricky. So when we're interfacing with people we know and love and trust, we can afford to be innocent as doves. But when we're confronted with negative forces that represent power and control, we can't afford to be innocent as doves. We have to be wise as serpents. We have to be able to predict what they may want to do next so that we can actually avoid their next move, just like in the game of chess, right? I know you play some chess, Jeremy. I love playing chess. When you're playing chess, the whole art of the game is to really both anticipate what you want to do while also being aware of what your opponent is trying to do. So if you understand the rules of chess and you're surveying your opponent's layout, you can know pretty quickly what their next possible options are. You know exactly what they're able to do as if you were in their position. And then you can move your pieces in such a way that avoid the traps they're trying to set for you. And so this is how the negative polarity works, right? It's just a chess match. And so to be a wise as a serpent is to understand the game that the serpent plays and play it better. And if that sounds stressful to anyone, I'll give you this encouragement that this isn't actually challenging to do. Because again, the negative polarity has only a few possible chess moves that they can use. Controlling people, especially vast amounts of people, is extraordinarily difficult. It's the most difficult endeavor you could ever undertake. So there's not a whole lot of ways you can do it. There's just a couple of methods that you can use. And so in our reaction clips, I'm going to be playing some clips for you, Jeremy, that will highlight this fact. But um, it's really about like looking at what events have taken place in our past. You know, we had 9-11 and then whoop, Patriot Act, give us your rights to survey you. And then we say, okay, so that's how they do it. They make a disaster. They, they, whether they do it themselves or they allow foreign entities to do it, doesn't matter. We won't get into that. They allow or create a tragedy, a crisis, and then they provide the solution very quickly while everybody's in a fear state. Okay, so that's one strategy. That's an example, right, of how you can look at the past and history and learn the way the game is played. And the more you do that, Jeremy, the more you realize, yeah, it's, it's actually just one strategy. They just do the exact same strategy every single time in slightly unique ways. But if you're looking at the underlying rules being played, it's the same exact play out of the same exact playbook every time. We call it the Hegelian method, right? Problem, reaction, solution. And so whether it's CBDCs, vaccines, all these other things we could mention, it's the same play on all of those things. It's create a problem, control the reaction in the news, fear, fear, panic, panic, and then offer the solution. All right. Solid setup for that. <laughs> now we're ready to dive into some reaction clips. I'll pull up one first and uh, we'll let Aaron react to it. Once again, guys, for our reaction clip segment, these are things that we have not seen. So I'm going to be pulling up a reaction clip. Aaron's going to watch it. We're going to get his take on it. He's going to pull up a clip I've never seen or we haven't discussed this previously. We're going to get my reaction on it, so on and so forth. You want to end all plastic manufacturing? I said the plastics industry must be stopped. So does that mean end plastic manufacturing? I mean, in my dream world, sure. But I think that... So um, Oh, so well, what, go ahead. No, so, I, I, and I don't mean to be condescending here. I just point out, what's going to replace your glasses? Um, 
I so I do know. I told you around your face. Oh, she yeah, didn't they're think made about that. <laughs> Maybe. No, I don't know what they're made out of. They are. What, so, what about, and I'm just pointing out some things here because I just want to be realistic when we're having conversations because when statements are made like this, I just want to open people's eyes and say, well, what? okay, that's easy to say, but what's the solution? Your water bottle in front of you. This one? Yes. That plastic? No. The lid is. That's plastic. Right. So right. It, I would it, say it, to your selfie, question that I would first be concerned about single-use plastics, and then we can talk your, about alternatives your, to this. Your, your cell phone there, is it plastic? The cases, but it's glass because I broke oh, the components the inside of it not yesterday. Plastic? The components made out of it's not in plastic? Yeah, they are. The water that you filled that water bottle up with, um, where'd you fill that water bottle up out of? A water filling station. All right, and it was delivered by a drink station that was plastic? I didn't check. The edges are. The piping coming to it. Now, you have a couple of choices with the piping. Um, we could go back. You just to not give it up, bro. <laughs> but then you have to have line it in chemical. Uh, or we could go back <clears throat> and use lead, because we used to have water piping that was lead. That was harmful to us. Uh, we go back to galvanized, but galvanized rust and had discoloration. Um, we go back to copper. But, but copper has to be mined, and everybody wants to stop mining in the U.S. So you use plastic to deliver piping that you fill that water bottle up with today. I, I point this out because the clothes you have on, I guarantee you have plastic in it. The shoes you have on your feet, the soles of those shoes are plastic. So we talk about any, any manufacturer, plastic manufacturing, and everybody in here cheers when you say that, but everybody here is depending on plastic as you set. So if you want to end it, then quit using it. It's kind of like, I don't sharp it or shop at certain places right now because I don't agree with some of their policies. I choose not to do that. You can choose to not use plastic. Do your work. If, 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 if you believe it, then live it that way. And, and, and if not, then tell me what the solution is. Yo, homeboy came prepared. <laughs> <laughs> Great clip selection, man. So my, my initial reaction to that is I love how this is highlighting the polarity dynamics of left and right or uh, um, masculine, feminine. So the left tends to represent the feminine polarity of like feelings, emotions. I feel about it this way. And the right tends to represent the logical, linear, rational thinking of the masculine. And right now in our culture, we have this war between the two polarities and one needs to stomp out the other one. And of course, that's just gonna create even worse imbalance. So the, the answer is always finding a harmonization between the two. And so like you see this, this woman I'm sure she has like really great reasons for wanting to get rid of plastic and uh, her, her intentions great, but she hasn't probably used enough of the masculine side of things to really contemplate, but how deep does this rabbit hole go? Could we just eliminate plastic? Is it that easy or would that create way more problems than it would solve? So the, the answer would be like, let's find a, a solution to plastic that actually has utility whatever that would be, I don't know, hemp or something like that. Let's make something out of a more sustainable product and then we can start replacing things in society with plastic that are that are plastic. That would be a more constructive way to approach the issue rather than what the what the left tends to do is like show up and say, I have these feelings, I'm upset, I'm angry. We need to destroy, tear down, annihilate this system. And then the right shows up with its like rigid, you know, rationalization saying, well, that's insane. And you're stupid for saying that that'll never work. And like nothing gets solved when, when that's the dialogue. So we need the left, the feminine polarity to say, Hey, this feels wrong. This feels off. There's something that needs to change here, but we need the right side masculine polarity to say, okay, what's a practical solution to that problem. And man, when the two polarities work together, things evolve and change very, very quickly. Um, the, the back and forth bickering just tends to slow, slow evolution down. Yeah. You know, what comes to mind for me when I watch this, <clears throat> these are problems of entitlement. If you look around society right now, we're arguing about gender. Mm -hmm. We're arguing about 
whether or not we're required to call people by their pronouns. We're arguing about whether or not we're allowed to have schools teach our six-year-olds pornography, (laughs) have them reading. We're arguing about things like plastics. We're arguing about things that you would never see this in a third world country. Why? Well, this is the byproduct of too much abundance for too long. Mm -hmm. Right. That's where my mind goes. It's interesting. I feel like there's, you know, and, and I'm not aware of any longitudinal study that's ever done this, and this would be very challenging to do, but I feel like there would be a direct correlation between how long a society has been prosperous for and the types of problems that are commonly uh, argued about or focused on in the town square, which in our society, you could call that, you know, the news on the the floor of Congress or Senate hearings, the things that are being voted on, et cetera, et cetera. So it's just, you know, there's a lot to be said about that, but that's the only thing that I'll mention is just um, we're at an interesting time where the best use of a lot of people's time and energy they feel is put into arguing about things that are really coming from privilege because we were born into an inflation-based, fiat-based society where we don't have to worry about a lot of these things. And so we feel like the most noble thing we could do is argue for, you know, 93 genders and that that's really the best use of our Mm -hmm. time and energy. More right. distraction. I see this as a very similar thing, right? It's like the climate change stuff. Our ancestors didn't have time to worry about climate change. So I'm not really having, this isn't a debate about that. I'm not interested in getting into that. I focus on solutions like homeboy in the video. But it is interesting to me. There's just like two, seems like there's two fundamental camps with that, right? The ones that want to focus on all of the little problems in the world. Yeah. And then ones that focus on like fundamental topics that are crucial to humanity's survival slash evolution. Mm -hmm. And from that perspective, it's just kind of funny. A lot of the things that the left tends to focus on nowadays are almost try to think of the main talking points, the main areas, right? What out of any of those are fundamental to our survival or our ascension? It's hard to think of any. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's an interesting place to be because it feels like we're living in a a hologram. (laughs) Yeah. Well, the left's ideology tends to have this destruction lust about everything. There's never like a positive solution of how we're going to go about this transition we want. It's just like, destroy it, kill it, death, death, death. And uh, I, you know, I sympathize with the congressmen, these people that in the Senate, in the house or whatever, that have to hear these activists coming in all the time, raging about destroy this, tear this down. This is bad. This is bad. And I appreciate the way whoever that was, that man handled it because he didn't do the typical right thing of like, we're going to make you look stupid and talk down to you like you're an idiot. But he was just like asking important leading questions which is going to force that young woman to say, okay, I have a good cause here, but I need to think through it a little more. I can't just come in and say, let's get rid of plastic. That's not reality. Same with fossil fuels. Let's get rid of fossil fuels. Not reality. We're going to destroy society itself overnight if we did that. And uh, you should care about that if you care about the well-being of humanity. You should love humanity more than you hate corruption. Let's put it that way. That's a very good way to say it. All right, you ready for mine? Yep. Yep. This is the first clip I chose, just a one minute short. The Western media is ignoring the story about what's happening to Western currencies. No coverage in the Wall Street Journal, no coverage in the Financial Times, no coverage in Bloomberg. Oddly, this story is being suppressed everywhere. A shady group of globalist elites who run our monetary system very quietly rolled out the new way that you will bank and pay for goods, where you'll buy your meat, your eggs, buy your gas, your petrol. All of these things will now be functionally controlled by this group. We've been warning about this for a long time on this channel, um, and you're 
starting to see a lot of the pieces come into place now. We told you about how the Fed Now program is rolling out in the United States. We've already seen CBDCs being rolled out in other countries as well, but this is the umbrella CBDC that would go over all of them. They're a secretive group of quote, sovereign states, central banks, commercial and retail banks, and other financial institutions. Is that sufficiently vague for you? <laughs> mm. So you heard that buzzword, sovereign states. Yep. And we're like, oh, we have a, we've been taught that means something very different. Yeah. So my reaction to that is, I honestly find that interesting that a lot of people aren't aware of that. I feel like in, in me and you's awareness, that was a pretty known thing when the, the Fed rolled out Fed now for testing. I think I want to say that was back in, was that like in August? Something like that. Yeah. As far as CBDCs, I think it's, you know, this ties in so much to today's conversation. We talked about the Bitcoin ETF. We're also going to be talking about uh, crypto a little bit more in a bit. Here's the thing. So we talked about how cryptocurrency represents a fundamental shift in power. It has the potential to decentralize power. If you had to explain in a sentence what the idea of crypto or the idea of Bitcoin does, I would say it like that. It's bigger than money. It has the, I, the ability to decentralize power. Now let's compare that to a central bank digital currency like the Fed now. That is a grasp at centralizing power. Do you see the difference? There's a big issue when we're talking about cryptocurrency with misunderstanding and a lack of education. A lot of people just group it all together. Oh, it's all digital money. No. No, no, no. <laughs> There's a massive fundamental difference between owning something on your own cold wallet, on your own private decentralized chain, and using a central bank digital currency. That can be turned off and turned on if you're a bad boy or girl. And, you know, we start to get into the stuff about China with the social credit scores. And, you know, if your credit scores at a certain amount, your uh, your card won't work when you go to fill, when you go to buy gas or, you know, you go to the store or whatever. That is the level of, you know, integration that a CBDC would have. So this is definitely a, you know, mark of the beast type uh, invention. Mm -hmm. And it's a grasp at, okay, Babylon is falling. How do we quickly pivot and reinvent ourselves to attempt to retain control? And that is what this decade is about. Yeah, It is the old systems trying to cling on to any last semblance of power and control. To their crumbling as empire. As the new systems violently come into the mainstream and it's volatile it's emotional as we're always talking about it's going to be you know this year will be a hell of a year but this decade in general there's a lot that's going to be sorted out uh you know it's it sounds like all fun and games to talk about the collapse of the dollar but to actually live through that is going to be bananas <laughs> and the CBDC is an attempt to keep us on a fiat-based system where, keep in mind, guys, once again, there is a set amount of Bitcoin that can or will ever be in existence, period. Fiat, not the same way. When you create a central bank digital currency, not the same way. They can inflate that. They can change that. They can turn that on and off. They can cancel it. Bitcoin is larger than any man or institution. So there's just fundamental differences. And I probably sound like a, a Bitcoin maxi, uh, which for your audience who doesn't know what that is, there's, you know, a lot of people are a lot very gung ho about uh, Bitcoin and they don't touch any other crypto. They're anti every other crypto because there is a fundamental difference. There is. Yeah. There's a reason the Bitcoin ETF was approved and we didn't, we don't have the approval of a, uh, you know, a shitcoin ETF or a random altcoin or whatever it may be. There is a fundamental difference. But having said that, there is also a lot of value in these other cryptocurrencies, but they're more like securities and such. 
So mm-hmm. all in all, it'll be interesting to see the the Fed now stuff. My you know my working base case thesis, which I I'm sure we've talked about on past shows, is simply that. I'm sure they're going to dangle a carrot in the form of, you know, your first thousand dollars free if you switch over from, you know, dollars to our CBDC. And just like the stimulus, you'll have, you know, millions of chattel run right into the slaughterhouse. Right. And to me, that's, you know, not to sound harsh, but I view it kind of as natural selection. There's always a bell curve. When you study anything in society, nature, the law of averages in large numbers, um, it's unfortunate. You know, me and you personally are trying to wake more people up to these things. But also, I think, you know, there's no way to to stop what is. And so the best we can do is understand that there's, you know, there's real opportunity here. This is not a this is not a doom and gloom thing. We're entering a time where there's going to be abundance like never before because the the global wealth is now going to be even more concentrated because storing wealth in this new world that started in 2020 is something that requires a way higher level of financial literacy than our parents and our grandparents needed. And this is the nature of my work. This is what I'm always screaming from the mountaintop about. A lack of financial literacy will literally kill us in this new world. Going forward, it's so important to be financially literate. And that doesn't mean stocks and bonds and budgeting. Like, that's wonderful. That's the old world. I'm talking about what the world's going to look like in 10 years. If you wait until the world looks like that, you're the one who got led into the slaughterhouse. Do you think that BlackRock is thinking a month ahead or a week ahead? Or do you think they're thinking a century ahead? There's a direct correlation between the amount of wealth a family has. Let's say Rothschilds, DuPonts, Vanguards, Rockefellers. There's a direct correlation between the amount of wealth that a centralized family, company, whatever has, and how far they think out into the future. So one of the biggest and easiest shifts everyone can make right now, and it goes back to the conversation around fight or flight and how most of us are stuck. All we can see is tomorrow because we can't worry about the future. We have to start worrying about the future. And worrying isn't the right word. We have to start being cognizant of and putting intention and attention into what is the world going to look like in 10 years? Caring about And then the reverse future. engineering that. And when you do that, you find that I'm not worried at all. I'm fucking stoked. And that's what that's what's so interesting. This is the last thing I'll say and then I'll stop talking. You know, in the nature of my work, we repeatedly have people, you know, come into my community. We help people, you know, with number one, building generational wealth for their family and number two, protecting it. And people come in and they are repeatedly like, it's just such a recurring theme that comes up of like, Jeremy, how do you like know all of this and not just be like depressed? And I'm just like, (laughs) and I'm sure you probably get that too, Aaron. I'm like, that tells me where they're at in terms of A, their level of study and B, their level of internal integration. Because I view it very much like the hero's journey. You go through, or like, I could actually liken it to the stages of grief, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> First denial, then anger, <laughs> you're projecting, and then and then you come full circle, right? It's just like that. Yeah. Waking up, right? Oh, it's devastating. It seems like everything me and Aaron are talking about is so negative, but it's not. Because every single thing, like the nature of Aaron's work, has a negative polarity and a positive polarity. So while, yes, there's going to be a larger and larger wealth gap, and yes, we're living through a generational shift in terms of the haves and the have-nots and technology and innovation and the way that money is stored and power dynamics and, and all of these things, every single one of those births an opportunity. And to me, we chose to come here to play this game during this time. Do you think it's a coincidence that the fourth turning we're going through right now 
also lines up astrologically with the shift in regards to the age of Aquarius. Have you thought about that, Aaron? A little bit. You have multiple timelines. You have 3D timelines and you have 5D timelines all pointing to this decade. To me, this is why I'm here. There's nothing I'd rather be doing. If I could choose if I could go back and choose to be born into a utopia, I would 10 out of 10 times choose to live this experience rather than a utopia. I'm with That's you, boring. Bro. The point of the human experience is to navigate duality. Yeah. We wanted to know what this is like, right? We wanted to come into form and to learn what separation is, what limitation is, what duality is, because without it, there's no relativity. How can you gauge bliss when it's all you've ever known? Yeah. It was just black, right? And then Genesis <laughs> 1, 1, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You need the contrast. When you're talking about the the how the elites plan generationally a hundred years in advance. At this, least. Yeah. yeah. This is just basic law of attraction 101. That's all that they're doing, right? It's the same thing yeah. we teach to do when you're trying to manifest something. We say, be in the end result first. First, you got to see it. Where do you want to be? Who do you want to be in that future version of yourself? And then you back engineer it. And then you work your way there day by day, holding that vision in mind. That's just basic manifestation, right? That's all that these banking families have been doing for a long time. And again, if we as humanity begin doing that together, we're going to be infinitely more powerful at creating the shared destiny we all want, which is a planet of unity and peace on earth and and uh, shared resources amongst all nations. And these are the things we want. We just have to see it together. And then it makes the contrast of whatever doesn't line up with that future vision appear very obvious, like a central banking digital currency, for example. No, we don't want to make resources more and more fake and more and more ethereal and illusory. We want to make them more tangible and real. We want to come back to reality. And I thought that that clip was interesting, and I wanted to get your take on it because... You know, we see this big push right now towards digital currencies. At the same time, if you're paying attention to Congress and the legislation that's getting passed, we're also seeing at the same time this massive push in legislation for uh, surveillance of all financial transactions, whether it's Venmo, PayPal, um, even at, a, at the governmental level, at, at the lower corporate level, we're seeing all these new legislations about, hey, if you want to do business with us, you're going to give us the right to monitor all your transactions at the same time that they're trying to make all, all currencies digital that they can control. Do you see the game that's being played here? So it's, it's pretty obvious when you just look at it from an objective view like that. And then it's easy to say, okay, no, I'm not going to participate in that system. And guess what? If all of us come together and say, no, we're not going to play that game with you then there's nothing they can do. They will have no ability to roll out a digital currency like that. But as we said a minute ago, Jeremy, this is one of the strategies of the negative polarity is that because they have to get your free will freely, they can only do a couple of things. And one of those things is trick you. The other thing is promise you something such as, as you mentioned, hey, if you if you accept our Fed now coin, Fed coin, whatever it'll be called, we'll give you a thousand free Fed coins. <laughs> and that's the that's the serpent's offer it's to like eat. Chuck E. Cheese. <laughs> yeah, hundred percent. It's monopoly money, right? It's when the serpent comes to Eve. What does he say? He says, "Oh no, no, no! God didn't say that you would die. God said that when you eat this apple, you'll be like Him. Isn't that what you want? That's a good trade off, isn't it?" And so Eve took the bait and said, "Oh yeah, being like God is awesome. I'd love to be like God." And she bites the apple. And the serpent has her. This is the classic negative polarity strategy. They're always going to offer you something, right? But you're a fool if you think that they're actually going to give you what they're promising you. Amen. I don't think you're ready for the second clip, bro. Bring it. <laughs> so this one probably isn't going to be one that we uh, talk about for a super long time. But <laughs> I, I had to put it in because... We told you guys in our initial episode that this year is going to be fucking wild. And uh, this is just like the culmination of that. So I had to uh, I had to put it in here. Dude, if January is any indication of how this year is going to go, we're in for a wild ride. <laughs> I just can't with that history. In accordance with the laws oh, yeah. of the state of Nevada, this court... Oh, 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 oh,
<laughs> yeah, the convict there who dove onto the Las Vegas judge during his sentencing on Tuesday refused to show up in court today. Footage from the courtroom shows the 30-year-old defendant tackling the Nevada District Court judge behind the bench there. He's now facing 13 charges, including seven new counts air. of battery for attacking the judge and the officers who came to her rescue. <laughs> He's due back in court on Tuesday. We'll see if he... Did you see the full video of them, like, beating him? Of course. Yeah, like, the, the dude in the suit. Did you see that guy? Like, the, yeah. the white, middle-aged dude in the suit who looks all innocent. He's throwing and these he's rabbit like, punches. And he just starts, like, <laughs> kicking him and He's like, I'm just going to stand here and punch you. He's like, I've wanted to do this my whole life. <laughs> I get <laughs> Free to punch shot. someone for a good cause. Yeah. Dude, my first what reaction... Was, uh, what was your thoughts when you initially saw that? My first reaction, bro, was... I was like, I is that Michael Jordan? Yeah. Like, yo, <laughs> yeah, that yeah. dude has some hops. Duncan from the free throw line? <laughs> Straight up <laughs> Superman, bro. That dude, like, Superman over that judge podium. Yeah. And uh, my, my deeper reaction to it is, like, this is... These are the kind of reactions you get from a corrupt justice system. I don't know what he was being tried for, but like we know for a long time in this country, especially African-Americans have been treated especially bad by the justice system. But the, the whole justice system itself is just incredibly corrupt because it's a corporation pretending to be a judicial body, pretending to mediate over conflict so they can make money off of conflict. It's just a business model or a profit model. And that shows in the level of unfairness that we see in that it's not innocent until proven guilty. It's guilty until proven innocent. We see this with the J6 stuff, right? You can just lock people behind bars who weren't even at January 6th. Some people that weren't even there are still in prison right now, haven't even had a trial yet, haven't even been convicted of something yet. So how can you look at that and think we have a real justice system? It should cause you to start asking some of those questions of like, how are they getting away with this? There's got to be something that's happened to subvert our justice system because it wasn't always this way. And I think, you know, this, this poor guy just had probably had enough of it for whatever reason. I think in the video he was denied bail. Um, and the judge says right before he Superman dives over the podium, <laughs> uh, she says something like, if I remember, um, no, I deny bail because he needs to learn his lesson in prison now. Like he needs to go to prison to get his karma type of thing. And he obviously felt that that was unfair and couldn't repress the anger anymore. So I have sympathy for him, but um, this is, these are things that happen on a daily basis, right? These kind of unfair um, trials and whatnot in sentences. And uh, it's just that fact that this one made the news because the dude became Michael Jordan and flew yeah. over the podium at the judge. For sure. Yeah. Very interesting. He, from what I saw, he apparently was being charged with uh, like battery or whatever you call it, like physical You don't assault. say. <laughs> so the irony was uh, she should have known <laughs> what she was messing with. So she, he was, uh, she was just next on his list. Did you see any of the, the memes or the pictures of um, – so he did have a follow-up date and the judge court ordered him to have to come before her in a follow-up or whatever? He came in, bro. Did you see this? I didn't. He came in looking like absolute Hannibal Lecter. They oh, they man. had him like chained like arms, feet. He was wearing a net over his head so he couldn't like spit or anything. A mask over his face. Like and then the the memes, man. The internet is undefeated. It was uh, it is. there's some hilarious stuff on there. <laughs> Oh man, but yeah, obviously that's uh that's pretty sad, and we don't condone that. Apparently, the the judge was uh like actually quite uh injured and such because he he made full contact, full direct contact. contact with the ribs and such. But um, yeah, that's crazy, man. He must have played free safety in high school or something. Yeah, <laughs> he wore his Air Jordans to court. Obviously. <laughs> He had some some spring in that step. I've made this point before, but um, in a in a very big way, like crime is a response to a super corrupt justice system. Because yeah. if you have a very very fair rule set that is enacted fairly, it de incentivizes crime majorly. Because in a society that's fair, everybody wins if you're behaving well, and everybody loses when you don't behave well. But 
we live in a society that you're punished greatly for behaving well a lot of the time. And so, of course, you're going to get this pent up feeling of karmic retribution in the population that turns into crazy viral videos like this one. Mm, good point. Hello, and welcome to Channel One, a new way of consuming, reporting, and thinking about the news powered by artificial intelligence. Today, you'll witness AI-generated stories and headlines, captivating visuals and data-driven insights. From global news to finance to entertainment, we'll show you how technology enables us to bring you a global perspective 24-7, right from the heart of our AI native newsroom. Bro, was that AI generated as well? Every single thing you just saw was computer generated. Wow. Isn't that nuts? Yeah, that's nuts. A lot of thoughts on that. So first off, the speed at which Moore's law and and you know the network effects and the the growth of AI has been moving at since remember like when the chat GBT the initial launch hit the mainstream, like it became open source and everyone's like chat GBT. Yep. I want to say it was like... Like 21 or something. I want to say it was like June 2022. Maybe. I made a, I made an AI video on it like within the month and it did very well. And I think I remember it was around that time. But anyway, just like, you know, since then we've had incredible leaps from, you know, we have like Adobe Firefly with the content creator stuff, AI generated we have like Opus AI. I'm sure you're familiar with that. You know, you plug in a, a video and it makes you high level captioned short form. We have ones that can do uh, B roll now. Mm -hmm. We have, uh, oh, I'm trying to think of the, the image one. It makes super high level images that you couldn't tell aren't real. Yeah. That one. Just the shift, right? At first it was just LLMs, which is like, language learning models like the essentially like a chat GBT that's that's a sub classification of of AI but now we're seeing like you know more and more like deep fakes and some of the more visual aspects of it right and now like AI can make your logos it can uh, it can talk for you and we're even starting to see I don't know if you've seen this thing but there's like an AI you can have an AI girlfriend and it's like indistinguishable yeah. like it's becoming a big like thing yeah, and it and it will be. You think about how many people, you know, what percentage of, and this is more in the realm of like a stuff that Andrew Tate and stuff talk about. But what percentage of you know um, young men are like uh, virgins who have never uh, been with a woman? They don't. They don't get um, incels. They don't get sexual or romantic or emotional stimulation from the other sex. It's a large percentage, way larger than it's been in the last hundred years. So these types of things it's going to take over every every space like we've been you know talking about for a while but particularly the news one to speak more directly on that is fascinating that's uh number one you couldn't tell that that was ai generated already yeah and we're in january 2024 and number two the if you think about one of the main bottlenecks like for example me and aaron are already experiencing this one of the main bottlenecks of having a news show is the sheer volume of a content that you have to put out like yeah. for example we do once a month and it's like there's so much like we have to really distill it down it's like and, a whole but, new world every month yeah like literally and then and that's only accelerating with you know how small the world's gotten because of technology innovation and all of these things right the internet social media so like the amount of things that happen on a daily basis we would have to have a daily news show and even then there would be an immense amount to cover right mm -hmm. so if you think about like the pain point or the bottleneck that that's solving ai one of the biggest use cases for it right now is what speed and efficiency right mm -hmm. how long would it take you to do a certain task that you can type in a sentence to chat gbt and it just did it for you right it's currently one of the value adds is that it saves people time so i really like that notion of like every day it's delivering you you know, a lot, an, an aggregated funnel of news that is saving, you know, how long would that have taken, you know, the whole research team to put together 
and then the actual like news anchor or the hosts or whatever to speak on it like that's you know that's a real production like me and Aaron are, have learned this it's <laughs> there's a lot of work that goes in behind the scenes to doing something like this guys and so uh that's very interesting to me and then the only the only the last thing I'll say is just that now it's now we're going to start running into the problem of okay but just like when you ask chat gbt something about climate change or gender or is this person good or bad you're seeing bias because mm -hmm. it was programmed so now we look at okay well it's fetching us news but is there a slant and my hunch is how could there not be mm -hmm. and this is something elon speaks about right like if you if you ask chat gbt a question and you ask i think it's called grok right the twitter's ai okay are you familiar that twitter I launched a that. paid ai no. Yeah, Elon moves with the fucking quickness. <laughs> no joke. So it's already better than uh, ChatGPT, and I think it's a paid thing. Like you have to be a Twitter user, an X user. Wow. And I want to say it's like twenty dollars a month or whatever, similar to ChatGPT. Yeah, yeah. So I've seen on uh, on X. So you ask it a question, and you ask ChatGPT the same question, and you can see the political slant difference. Oh yeah. One will tell you this is misinformation this didn't happen the other will tell you more Facts. of the the truth yep <laughs> uh so that's a big issue with these llms right which are these um i think it stands for language learning model let me make sure yeah, i'm not butchering right. it uh llm right. meaning it's either large language model or language learning model large language models so essentially, these are aggregating the world's information, right? The collective consciousness hive mind. Mm -hmm. And you literally in 15 seconds, regurgitating it, right? That's like taking what would you would normally need a an entire tribe of, you know, 10,000 brilliant scholars across fields. And it's right there Nanoseconds. on your phone. Right. So that's that's what an LLM does. And it's interesting. The, our main issue of the next, you know, five to 10 years is is bias. Until we get to a point where AI trains AI, that will be a whole other problem. But for now, <laughs> humans are training AI until AI reaches sentient consciousness and can train itself, which will, that is the thing that scares people. And I totally understand that. But for now, who are the humans training AI? Which way do most tech companies slant? Well, just where are they located? Yeah. Silicon Valley. Where is that? Bay Area. Mm-hmm. So you understand the ideology in that in those areas and and that's being programmed into our technology, right? So you have like Microsoft did it uh ha has it with Bing, right? Bing AI. Yeah. And then they they just tried to like force take over OpenAI, so technically Microsoft owns ChatGPT now and all that. I don't oh, know wow. if you if you if you kept up with that whole thing of like mm. with Sam Altman, the the founder of OpenAI and such like there was like a forced step down. And then there was rumors that Microsoft forced him out. But then he was like, came back. And then I don't know where that's at right now. Because when he left, everyone, the rest of the team boycotted and was like, we will not work with Microsoft without Sam. Wow. So I believe they brought him back. But we never know behind the scenes what's actually happening. Are they on the same side? Is this just, you know, news? Or is this actually like something going on? But anyway. Yeah. That's the main concern, right? Is it's the same way. It's like people are concerned about the education system because it's like, what are these people teaching my children, right? Well, I have the, a right the, to know. the 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 LLMs is like, who's teaching us? <laughs> like, if you control the information, that's an issue, right? That's the issue with media, mm -hmm. media companies and such. So, that would be my only uh, my only concern, but. I could definitely, you know, see myself uh, enjoying a service like that if it were able to be neutral and and just deliver, de deliver what happened yeah, essentially, that'd be great. right? Uh, but and so currently, that's what I use uh, X for. That's what I use Twitter for, right? Okay. To kind of understand uh, information and and then form my own takes on it. But curious what what uh, what your thoughts are after after seeing that. Well, anytime you get a new innovative technology like AI or cryptocurrency, you always see this mad rush and fight between the top corporations to have a monopoly over that technology because then they can begin weaponizing it and all that. So with AI, like obviously a lot can go wrong with an entire fake 
news report like that where not a single image you saw was reality. It was all computer generated. And so you can imagine the fake news world we live in already getting 10 times worse. But here's where the net positive is. The harder the darkness fights, the more the light awakens. So if you can imagine the absolute detest most people have already for mainstream media, and then you imagine these mainstream media outlets, CNN, MSNBC, Fox, trying to use AI generated news and like literally creating stories that didn't happen at all. There was a story like that recently. I don't remember what it was, but one news outlet was running a story of a deep fake video and saying that this event really happened and it finally got fact checked. And it was like, yo, this is a completely made up AI generated video and you're reporting <laughs> on it like actual news. So you see that that could happen a lot more, but wouldn't that make people detest mainstream media even more and distrust it even more? You bet it would. So I think yep. what we're not going to see are the independent journalists using fake AI generated news. They're going to be the ones who want to report on reality. And the only people trying to use AI news like that are going to be these multinational corporations and the bought and paid for corporate press that nobody trusts already anyways, whose demographics are plummeting by the second anyways. So I think like it's, it's going to be too tantalizing for them to resist and they're going to want to get their dirty little clutches on it as fast as they can, but they won't be able to see the consequences of doing it because for some reason, dude, they just seem to be so out of touch with the ordinary average person and how they think and feel. It's like they're using an old world model from like the 70s, 80s, 90s of this is the way people used to react to the news and absorb the news. And it's like, yo, <laughs> that world's dead and gone. We live in 2024 where people are getting news from social media now, from friends texting them things, and they don't trust these corporate press media outlets any longer. So go ahead and use AI news. I dare you and see what happens. It's not going to be good for corporate press when it happens, but I think we both know it's inevitably going to happen. 100%. All right. This next one's going to be good. A little bit longer. With all the news coming out today, what would you do about the individuals on Jeffrey Epstein's flight logs? Yeah, look, we got to actually, and first of all, that's not even the whole thing. Why are we only seeing a partial list, a redacted list? So what I'm thinking right now, and you know, I didn't, a few years ago, I didn't think this way. People say, is this a conspiracy theorist mindset? No, it's just a reality awakening based on how the game is played. I think that was actually a deflection because it was a way to at least placate the people who have been making demands a for a long time to actually avoid releasing. Just give us the full list. Give us the full video footage of what happened inside and outside the prison. Tell us exactly why Jeffrey Epstein was saying before he, before he said, they tried to kill me, I'm not committing suicide. And then what ends up happening is what it looks like his brother actually has offered a different account in recent days. My answer is we deserve a government that tells the people the truth. Lay out the full information, not the partial list, not the redacted list. Why do you need redactions? List the whole thing. We, the people, deserve the truth. We have a government that has systematically lied to us. From the truth of, I mean, all the way, it goes back, these are third rails you're not supposed to touch. The truth about Saudi Arabia's involvement in 9-11, all the way to the basis for the war in Iraq, all the way to the basis for the 2008 bailouts, all the way to the Trump-Russia collusion hoax that never was. The Hunter Biden laptop story we were told that was false on the eve of the last election. Absolutely true. To the origin of COVID-19, which absolutely did begin as a man-made virus in a lab in Wuhan, which would have been censored if you said as recently as two and a half years ago. Weapons of mass destruction, of mass destruction in Iraq. That's what I was referring to, the basis for the war in Iraq. All the way to how our money's being spent in Ukraine. The truth about what happened on January 6th, which we still don't know. Well, it, but the extent to which and how, tell us the details. Release the video footage all the way to the Nashville Transgender Shooter Manifesto, which they refused to release. Every other shooter manifesto released except for that one until it got leaked, all the way to the Jeffrey Epstein client list. We deserve a government that tells the people the truth again. And if there's one thing I can promise you as your US president, we will tell you the truth, not just when it's easy, but when it's hard. Tell you the truth when it's ugly. That's how we actually rebuild trust in this country. You want to know something? If you want somebody who's actually going to get in there and speak truth to power, start by voting for somebody who's going to speak the truth to you. We could stop it there. 
that was not about politics. That was about the about 11 things that he just dropped. <laughs> Yo. Uh, I'd love to hear your, your thoughts on that. My thoughts are Vivek knows too much, bro. He knows too much. He's spitting too many facts. It's crazy to watch him in like any town hall type of thing with a corporate press reporter because they oh, will yeah. not let that dude speak. They, mm. they waterboard him when they try to interview him. They're like, so you said this conspiracy theorist thing about January 6th. What do you say? He's like, well, let's talk about the facts. I'm like, now I'm not going to stop you there. Like they, they railroad this dude when he tries to talk, which is how you know they don't want him to be spitting those facts. So on the Epstein thing, I mean, I was really disappointed about that for the single reason of we almost had real hard evidence that would have forced the hand of you know, the judicial system to actually enact some semblance of justice around Epstein Island, which was, and tell me if you saw this, there was a, a girl who in the court documents released a document to the judge, I believe it was, where she said, I have in my personal possession videotapes recorded by Epstein at Epstein Island of Bill Clinton, Prince Andrew, and um, Richard Branson. Yep. Yeah. The... um. Virgin Atlantic. And there was a fourth guy who's, I think, some billionaire, but I didn't recognize his name. Yeah, she said, I have videotapes of these men sexually abusing my friend when she was, you know, 12 years old or whatever. And, uh, but she signed, so this is what was crazy to me, is she said that she signed, so Hillary Clinton came to this girl shortly after I'm imagining that took place. And she knew that they had somehow been, probably Epstein gave them the tapes because he was in this kind of like, global blackmail ring of trying to blackmail every big rich and famous person in the world through his honey traps. And so he, I, I'm guessing Epstein gave them these tapes. I don't know how else they would get them, but Hillary Clinton apparently knew that they had had these tapes. And so she came to this girl's house and made her sign an NDA that said, look, we're going to pay you a lot of money to shut up and never talk about this. And if you do ever talk about this, we're going to kill you. And that was in the contract she signed, apparently. <laughs> so her friend was telling the judge, I will release these tapes to you if and when I get my friend's consent, because she's the one whose you know, skin is on the line here. Mm. And she said, I've actually transferred these videotapes onto multiple USB drives and sent them to different people around the world, friends of mine, to keep them uh, hidden. But she said, I won't release these until my friend signs off. And she said, I spent two hours trying to convince my friend that this was the right thing to do. And so we thought for a few days we were going to get those tapes released. Not that any of us want to see them, but we want undeniable evidence to be finally presented so that at last some justice will be enacted around this. And uh, I think it was like two days later, her friend came back and said, I redact all my claims. I can't say anything at this point. Um, Sorry, AKA Hillary's team probably called her up and said, we will kill you if you let your friend, you know, release those tapes. And so that's the unfortunate reality of the world we live in where people of power have that level of control and enacted in those ways. But it's still a net positive in the fact that we have people that are that close to saying, I don't care. I will put my life on the line to get justice. Because in a system where the elites can get away with literally the worst imaginable crimes to the human imagination and have no consequence, but you and I will get thrown in prison if we don't pay taxes or something, there's such a topsy-turvy, upside-down balance in our legal system that if we're going to awaken and heal our planet and move towards an enlightened civilization, we have to start tipping that balance back to where everyone is under the same law system, everyone is treated the same. And that won't happen until we, the people, start demanding that that happens. And so through all this Jeffrey Epstein stuff, you're at least seeing this demand, right, from people where we're like, no, we're not going to forget about this. We're not just going to move on to the next PSYOP and the next distraction. We want that client list. And you've seen that for the last two to three years. People are not letting go of this issue. And I think it's really bothering the elites, all the people on his list, of course, who... Um, expected this probably to go away and it's not going away that's another big net positive for humanity's awakening 100 percent. 
Yeah, I couldn't agree more with you. They definitely, they had to have been expecting this to go away by now because they own all of the media companies. Right. So it's like they're the ones who would control the distribution. But once again, fourth turning, technology, this is where it's like technology gets demonized, but social media is not all negative. Social media has made everyone a reporter now. Everyone can have opinion and information has been decentralized. YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, this is where shit spreads now. And if things go viral, it can go, it can reach more eyes now than if it were to air across the entire legacy media's five o'clock news, right? All you have to do is go on Joe Rogan and other clips repurpose you being on there and all of a sudden you're, you know, the entire world knows what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. So it's a fascinating thing to see. And I agree with you. Definitely disappointing the, uh, you know, what was released in the whole redacted thing. It's just ridiculous, but also I don't think that's the last of it. (laughs) So we'll see, we'll see what comes out this year, especially when we see presidential candidates like Vivek out here, dropping, (laughs) dropping nine 11, dropping Ukraine, dropping Epstein, all the things you're going to start to see. And, and Robert Kennedy speaks on these areas as well. We have two real candidates now. And once again, guys, stop being so myopic in our comment section. We are not telling you that this political theater is real and that you should fall asleep to the dream. That's not the point of the Vivek clip. I will not be voting. I am not thinking that he's some white knight. Once again, this is powerful, and I've showed this to Aaron because in a fourth turning, the mainstream has to become aware of what is going on, and then when that number gets large enough and that snowball has built up enough mass and enough momentum, that is when you have revolution, Mm -hmm. and that is our best way out of this the other two options are violent you have civil war and you have world war yeah so i'm hoping for revolution now you can have peaceful revolutions and you can have violent revolutions but i've been saying it over and over and yet we still have people in our comments like you know jfk i'm sure you saw them but rkj jr or whatever um you know, he's a psyop. Look at his stuff with Israel, Palestine. Did you see these comments, Aaron? The, the second there's a thing they disagree with him on, they're like, oh, he's an Illuminati member. Yeah, yeah. People were trying to, trying <laughs> to roast a, you that's for a pretty big talking leap. positively about him. But yeah, look, once again, conceptually and ideologically, this is important. It's not about the man. It's not about the person. This is, this is just my take. The fact that these things are being talked about right now on a global stage is important. We've never, ever, ever had a presidential candidate up until Trump who was willing to say things that the media didn't want them to say. And even with Trump, he would really just kind of attack the media and he would kind of personally attack politicians. But he wouldn't like go that deep. Like, sure, he'll he'll bring up like Hunter Biden and the Biden's family. But he wouldn't, for example, talk about pedophilia. He wouldn't talk about. 9-11 9-11 being an inside job, he wouldn't go, he, there's a, there's a line he wouldn't pass, right? He would kind of like go hard in certain areas, like financially or corruption, but he wouldn't go into like what's really going on. Mm-hmm. We now have two candidates, one on the left, one on the right, who are both dropping bombs. <laughs> so that is number one, how you know we're in a fourth turning and number two, that excites me. Not because I'm going to go out and vote for them. And you mentioned you have a different take, which I totally respect, but just personally, not because I'm going to go vote for them, but because ideas run the world. Narratives run the world. That is why the media is more powerful than politicians. Point blank period. You can't argue that. Ideas run the world. So what's more important? Who's in office or the global collective consciousness circulation of ideas, right? Right. So the more that these ideas can be talked about, can be regurgitated, can be 
repurposed, you know, the more reaction videos on the internet there are about, can you believe what they just released or the aliens at this mall or (laughs) the Epstein list or whatever it may be, all the crazy stuff that's already happened in January, the more people are like, what the hell? And they pull their head out of the sand and they start talking about these things. And this is how trends and demographics and sentiment and ultimately generations kind of ebb and flow. And we're starting to phase out of a super feminine head in the sand season, if you will, an era. And we're starting to head into the yeah. curtain pulled up, masculine, time for accountability, solutions, and d- new systems era. And you can feel it. You can feel it. That's what Tate represented. That's what this election represents. Not because it is the solution to anything. (laughs) Not because any single human isn't a flawed man. They are. But because of the, look, zoom out. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Zoom out. Right. The shift in society right now is more towards masculine solutions, accountability, ownership, and truth than it was four years ago. Mm -hmm. That is the important part, not who will win the election. That's my stance. Yeah, it's about what they represent. What what Trump represents is the fact that no politician prior to Trump had ever been able to be like brash and brazen and off the cuff and swear sometimes and criticize the media, criticize... The de- even mentioned that there is a deep state and then say, I'm going to drain the swamp. No politician had ever done that because it had never been done before. And nobody thought that that was a successful strategy to get elected. Exactly. And then you had Trump come up and he's just talking off the cuff and saying, you know, pulling all the strings, revealing what's behind the curtain. And it was a huge success. And so what that did, I mean, it got him elected, but what it did was it set a precedent that now the next upcoming candidates are going to look at Trump's model and say, ah, People like that. People like brazenly telling the truth to the face of power and whatnot, maybe using a little bit of, uh, you know, foul language here and there. We never heard a politician swear before Trump. And now you have, like you're saying with Vivek, clearly he's taken a page out of Trump's playbook, right? He's just pulling out all the the truth nukes everywhere. And he even, uh, the other day I saw, you know, some segment, where Van Jones, I didn't see what Van Jones said, but somebody said Van Jones was calling oh, yeah. Hitler and yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, this yeah, guy is that. the next Hitler and stuff like that, which is just crazy. And yep. Vivek was at some town hall in Iowa, I think, and he yep. was addressing it and he was like, Van, shut the F up. And the audience <laughs> yeah, stands yeah, yeah. and starts cheering and clapping for yes. that comment. And I was yes. like, that's what gets people excited, like <laughs> telling someone yeah, to shut yeah, the yeah. F up. But it's because what it represents, it represents, no, I'm not going to take your BS anymore. I'm going to tell the truth, even though you're criticizing me for it. And that's really what people are cheering for, even though it's a, it's a very like low vibrational way of going about that. But, um, before we close this dude, I wanted to get your take on this clip because this isn't a reaction clip I chose for you, but, um, I don't know if you saw Megan Kelly's clip about the Epstein stuff. Mm -mm. So she had this really interesting kind of strange cryptic message. Uh, when she did her video on the Epstein. Some sort of planned execution by those who stood a lot, to stood to lose a lot. Uh, former Attorney General Bill Barr, who was AG when this all happened, told me on this show he does not believe this was anything other than Jeffrey Epstein taking his own life. And he was wide open to that possibility, but he'd reviewed a bunch of videotapes and so on. Uh, it's all fascinating, and we're not done with Jeffrey Epstein. I can tell you that for a fact. can't tell you how I know. But I can tell you for a fact, we're going to hear a lot more about Jeffrey Epstein in the coming year. Uh, and you may be even hearing from him directly. More on that as I'm allowed to tell you. <laughs> Come again? Yeah. Damn. I that would be not like sure the, the movie. That would be like the movie The Prestige. Have you ever seen that? <laughs> <laughs> But All Epstein's of a sudden, he not pops the good up. Guy you, think, the story. you think he's been dead, and he's like, "I'm over here." <laughs> <laughs> oh man, can you imagine? Like, I'm guessing what it means is that he recorded some kind of manifesto, 
where he's gonna wow you know what i mean like a video or something this year's i mean <laughs> we couldn't have picked a better year to do the show <laughs> 2024th turning is this year yeah 2024th <laughs> turning all right That's now for my nuts. real reaction clip okay did you see this cat williams interview on shannon sharp's Bro. pod <laughs> <laughs> that was my last one for you <laughs> oh was it was it this exact yep. clip no, no, no. It was more of the full thing because there, but there was about thirty minutes of it that needed to be kind of parsed through. Yeah, yeah. Well, this clip I thought was interesting. My ears perked up when I saw this on. It was like an Instagram reel someone used, and I tracked down the clip on YouTube. Are you related to uh, Luda? No. Um, so there was a crossroads where we were both invited to an Illuminati thing. And it had to be one or the other of us and decisions had to be made. So it was both of us, we were equal. One of us had to cut off all their hair and couldn't do the sideburn thing no more with the points. And the next person they said was going to get $200 million because they were gonna pay him 10 million a movie to do 20 movies. And that's how the conversation happened. One of those persons turned out to be ludicrous and the other person turned out to be Cat Williams. Now, one person ended up with a light-skinned, ugly-faced wife that's never done a... Remember I told you that if I say that, it applied to seven people? Yes. It's part of what they give you. Okay? I didn't get it. I'm wow. not mad about it. How much money did they give? 200? Sir, Fast and Furious is on what number right 10? now? Oh, my God. <laughs> 200 million, I might need to get me one of the more women to look, to look, look the same. That's what they all end up saying at the end of the day. Yo, he just oh, Kermit man. the Frogs right there. like, Dude, <laughs> that's so funny. Where, So have you seen the full interview? Not, No, I didn't watch the full interview. I saw all clips right. here and there. All right. So I kind of grew up, I don't know if you've heard me talk about this, but I grew up on hip hop culture. It's, it was my favorite music. It, it was a big piece of how I awakened because... Hip hop culture is very synonymous with anti authority and speaking about the system, right? Yep. So I kind of stay connected to a lot of that that culture, whether it be rap or or black comedy or just in general uh, athletes mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Um, so I, I watched the full episode when when it came out. It's like two and a half hours. Dude, he <sighs> broke the internet. Thirty. Did you see? I'll have to play for you mine then. So you haven't seen the full episode. So you haven't seen like the 30 minutes he goes in about a bunch of different people. I think I watched part of that. Yeah. He goes off on everybody, right? Kevin Hart and. Yep, exactly. Yeah. So he talks about, you know, everything from how, you know, any of the, the black comedians in power outside of like uh, him and Chappelle. Right. Have, you know, they have to go through the whole rituals of being humiliated and defamed. Like they have to play girls in, yep. in movies. They have to be raped, whatever it may be. And then they kind of, you know, they get their offers, whatever. They got to join the cult. Yeah. But as far as specifically the ludicrous thing, that's, I mean, you've never, he does a lot. And I don't know if you've watched his stand up, but even in his stand up, he's, he's always been a savage like that. Mm -hmm. Like he's very similar to Chappelle. Like he'll, 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 straight shooter say what happens to the point where people can't probably fathom it and they're like oh he's just you know he's just saying that um but as far as the ludicrous thing ludicrous reacted with a little freestyle did you see that i didn't yeah he did a little freestyle about how he's not in the illuminati oh wow how it's convincing. Like, well, it was like the most random reaction like a little a little hour or a little minute long freestyle about how he's not in the illuminati but at the end of the day, the there's a reason that that interview's like literally breaking the internet right now. I mean, he outed he outed P Diddy, he outed T D Jakes, bro. Do you know who that is? Oh, I didn't see that part, but I've heard T. about what's Jakes. going on with T D Jakes. So he got caught at Diddy's gay parties, if you will. P and, Diddy has uh, gay parties. Oh yeah, you didn't <laughs> know P Diddy's into that. This is all news to me, bro. Oh yeah, I'm I'm all up in this stuff. <laughs> So that, <laughs> yeah, they have all sorts of, you know, what you could call sexual deviant parties. Uh, but you would think it's like, you would think they're out here like having Playboy Mansion parties. Mm -hmm. 
but a lot of it is if you think about what comes with selling your soul and such, I would imagine they they start getting into darker and darker stuff and and nothing can can quench the thirst. So they start doing weirder and weirder shit, if that makes sense. That's the way I make sense of it. I obviously I'm not sure I've never, you know, and that's just the negative polarity in general, how it works. Yeah, right. So that's just how I think through it anyway. Well, TD Jakes, there's, you know, some investigative reporting videos that you can pull up and such, but unfortunate, excellent speaker. I love yeah. some of his stuff about, um, one of his videos is my favorite of all time. Literally. Um, the one about like, it takes courage to win. I love that one. Um, takes courage to be successful. And he's like sweating beads and he's like, courage, dude. He's just such a powerful orator and, and yeah. speaker and, and influencer of people. And then you hear, you know, many years back, there was some partnership with him and Diddy. And then who knows if it was a blackmail, if it was forced, if it was yeah. a started out with good intentions. But at the end of the day, you can't accept incentives or privileges just like with the government mm -hmm. when you accept privileges it's the beginning of the end that's and the so apple, now right? you know you have him getting caught with at some sort of gay men orgy thing uh and he the next day was doing an event speaking and he did this whole thing crying and claiming you know they're they're uh they're, they're lying, lying about me and all this stuff and it's anyway uh yeah, he went in on on basically everyone, and that's most of it wasn't news to me. But what was crazy is my man just came out of the darkness. He doesn't really do podcasts. Yeah, came out of the darkness and just, I mean, went in. Um, and you know, usually they're like cryptic. <laughs> like Tate will be a little bit more cryptic. Yeah, None this of that. was this was sniper rifle. Yeah, and in depth like when questioned about a certain thing would go in depth into here's exactly what happened on set of the show mm -hmm. and walk through it. Here's exactly what was in the contract. He even went into Harvey, Harvey Weinstein uh, drop into his knees, ask trying to blow cat right in a room of uh, he's like, my whole team was there. Mm -hmm. And every other black man who was competing with me for that role was told that they had to do that just like Kat was told that. And he was like, I was the only one who said, fuck no. So what did all these other dudes do to get this role? Like statements like that where it's like, dude, <laughs> crazy. It makes me wonder like why he feels such a vendetta to just call out everyone for everything in one podcast, you know? He talked about it. Uh, oh, did he? So why don't I? I'll, I'll we'll sort through, through some clips since we both pulled yeah. up the same thing. Before you get to yours, though, one last thing I wanted to say about why I chose that clip was, again, we we lose appreciation for how fast things evolve in society. Even like Literally. we just mentioned with like Trump and Vivek and how before Trump, no politician would even cuss, and now it's like you can't even compete with these guys unless you're being brash like that. In the same way, like. Five years ago, 10 years ago, for sure, the idea that the Illuminati runs Hollywood was still this conspiracy theory that most people said, there's no way that's true. That's silliness. And now you have multiple celebrities just coming out with it all over the place. I mean, Cat Williams has lived in Hollywood for most of his life. All of his friends are in Hollywood. He's more immersed in that culture than anybody. And he's just like, yeah, so the Illuminati approaches Ludacris and me, and they asked us for this or that. And he's talking about it like it's just normal, everyday stuff that everybody understands now. And I think that's, again, a huge positive sign for the evolution of things and the awakening of things. Because whether or not it's, it's an organization that calls themselves the Illuminati, or if that's just a convenient term we all use, there's some kind of negatively polarized cult that runs Hollywood. Undoubtedly, it's, in my opinion, more likely a Freemason cult of some kind. And they... They control these actors in all the ways that you mentioned, all the ways that Kat mentioned. Uh, Dave Chappelle talks a lot about it. You know, Hollywood's yep. a sick, dark place that you don't want to be in. I have a good friend named Jimmy Levy, who you probably know of, who uh, got really big in 2020, I think it was. And he was invited immediately to this party in LA with all these other celebrities. And the very first party he was ever invited to, 
he sees like little children walking out of these doors with grown men. And he has these like trans men asking him to come do crazy things with them. He's like, yo, I, I just got here, man. <laughs> and it's yeah. like, this is how twisted the culture is where it's just like absolute Babylonian degeneracy at this point. And that's because a very powerful, smart and cunning group of people over the last, you know, 80 years, 70 years have gradually infiltrated the entertainment industry and begin taking control over it in these ways through blackmail, through incentivizing, like he talks about Ludacris getting offered $200 million, you know, to sell his soul to the Illuminati. And it's like, is there any wonder why our entertainment, especially for children and stuff, has gotten so distorted and twisted? It's because we have to face the facts of like, who are the people that really pull the strings these days for mainstream entertainment? It's not who it was when you and I were kids. It's things have changed dramatically, right? We have to be aware of that. And uh, I just think it's amazing that you have people like Cat Williams and Dave Chappelle, and we could list a ton more of celebrities that just talk about this now. Like, hey, y'all need to know what's really going on in Hollywood. Yep. It's like Sodom and Gomorrah. Literally. <laughs> Maybe worse. <laughs> Who knows? That's what it reminds me of. All right. So we're going to go through, obviously, this is like a 14-minute clip, so we're not going to play a 14-minute clip, but I'll go to a few parts so that you can hear this better, Aaron. And for the audience that isn't as, you know, tapped into this type of stuff. All of these uh, big de deviants is all catching hell in 2024. It's up for all of them. It don't matter if you Diddy or whoever you is. T.G. Wow. Jakes, any of them. The, all, every, all lies will be exposed. That's all. And, and, and anyone who takes that the wrong way know why they take it the wrong way. The truth is the light. I need to have no more of these. Let's go. Amen, amen. <laughs> I'll drink to like that. Two or three drinks back to back. Uh, like, I'm kind of <clears throat> getting on here. Right. After that, I don't really kind of know where to go. Let me one more time. <laughs> one more. <laughs> mm, mm. Right. We good now? Because the people want to know well, why would he get blackballed? Yeah. Oh, because I was ask because that. because in thirty years I've done nothing but collect information 30 years in hollywood knowledge wow. and your secrets so if you and a man was in a corner doing something you wasn't supposed to be doing you will tell it no somebody come to tell me okay i gather that i value that i'll pay for that come tell me i know so many things i shouldn't know and they all know it they <laughs> all know it why because you don't make me the villain not the guy that raises black children and ain't never done a hard drug in his life and don't have no stories of doing nobody dirty. And, and they'll Kevin just go Hart out and they'll lie. The, the industry doesn't mess with Cat because he didn't show up for the studio. No studios have ever said that. Look at my IMDb. It will show you that no studio has ever lost money with me on the script. Pause How? It? That's why I'm saying that's why. I there's, you can sense such a like righteous anger in his voice. Mm -hmm. Like when I said a minute ago, I wonder where it all comes from. I think homeboy's just been hanging out in Hollywood for too long, seeing too much nasty, dirty, evil stuff. And he's just our, our natural conscience, right? Like he says, the light in us eventually can't, won't be able to stand it anymore. And it's like, when you have collected so much uh, of those, like he says, like dirty secrets that you shouldn't know about this person and that person. I can see how easy it would be to get to a boiling point like this, where normally you're watching these Hollywood elites getting away with murder on a daily basis. And like, you know what they're doing in secret and who they are in secret. And it's just that like kind of righteous indignation that again, it's uh, not like the highest possible vibration you could be on, but it's a step in the right direction. And yep. it seems like similar to the Megyn Kelly clip where she's like, yo, we're going to hear a whole lot more about Mr. Epstein this year. You know, we hear Kat saying the same thing. So it's like, what do all these people know that we don't know that like, whether it's, you know, a cyber attack that's being planned, that's going to release everybody's dark information publicly. I don't know, but these people sense that something big like that is coming, some kind of huge disclosure and truth revelation, which will be a very good thing for humanity in the long run. Yeah. Two things. So one, he's very vocal about having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. 
Mm-hmm. And he has since he was a young child. He said when he was five, he was directly communicating with God. Um, and so he's very strong in his relationship to God, which he, you'll hear him talk about that yeah. in this clip, I believe. He talked about it throughout the podcast about how, you know, there's God and then there's Satan and all of this is Satan, which is why he's not afraid. It's just very similar to your perspective. It's just the inversion of truth. They're not actually, they can't actually do anything and he's protected. Um, He gets it. Yeah. And then the other piece is people have come on this podcast, Club Shay Shay, which is very big in um, Mm -hmm. the uh, melanated community and multiple other melanated com- comedians have come on here and uh told incorrect stories and basically lies that involved cat yep. so in the beginning he's like he went he went in for 30 minutes before uh shannon sharp could ask him a question because he was like you let you know he had a lot of insults but essentially to paraphrase he's just like you let these dudes come on your show and defame my name i came on here to correct the record So that's where all this is coming from. Uh, People were telling stories apparently that he deemed incorrect. And so he's like, if you're going to lie about me, I'm going to reveal all your shit. They got their karma, bro. (laughs) (laughs) So let's let's see a few more. I'm going to skip around. Ricky Smiley say he was supposed to play Money Mike because I wrote the words from. So, you know, the movie Friday. Uh, Yes. That's what this is about. Like, I guess he played a pimp and there was this whole story. Money Mike. Yeah, there was this whole story that ricky smiley told on this show that was incorrect so he's coming on kind of studio has ever lost money with me on the script how that's why i'm saying that's why i can't let ricky smiley say he was supposed to play money mike because i wrote the words for money mike i designed the hair for money mike i collaborated with the wardrobe department and made outfits to make sure that no one in america would be wearing what money mike was wearing i told them to go get the prowler i then told them to paint it purple i told them don't have an actor at playing a pimp we could get an actual pimp archbishop magic don juan to play like i I did far too much work for somebody to come years later and try to tag along just for their own self-aggrandizement. Why didn't Cube set the record? I'm thinking I'm hearing it for the first time and they're giving it. That think like a man. Like, what are you talking about? They just, they think they can rewrite history. That uh, uh, Guy Tory did a beautiful special about the comedy store and Fat Tuesday, where he said that Steve and Cedric and Kevin Hart and Tiffany Haddish came through there and made all lies. Steve and Cedric never performed at the comedy store at all. Tiffany was Cedric only seen at jokes. the Laugh Factory. Mm-hmm. In 15 years in Hollywood, no one in Hollywood has a memory of going to a sold out Kevin Hart show. There being a line for him ever getting a standing ovation at any well, comedy he club. He already had his deals when he got here. Have that we heard a of plan. a comedian that came to LA in and plan. in his first yeah. year in LA, he had his own sitcom on network television and had his own movie called Soul Plane that he was leading. No, we've never heard of that before that person or since that person. What do you think a plant is? <laughs> Maybe people don't understand the definitions of these words. He just did his documentary Check with Chris out. Rock where he shows you that his whole upbringing in comedy was on the East Coast. Yeah, it was. So how simultaneously was he here in Los Angeles doing the same thing? It didn't happen. It didn't happen. And I, I, I hate to seem like a petty individual for picking apart lies, but Jesse Smollett going to keep lying until you say we don't believe you. Mm-hmm. Like it's important in the checks and balances of the universe that liars not get to make complete narratives for themselves. Are you not afraid about being blackballed again? These are some power people. What do you mean again? These people are not powerful. Satan can't create anything. That includes blessings for his people. That's why, do you know what the number one job of somebody that sold their soul in Hollywood is? What? Is to act like it didn't happen. They all do the same job. Why do you think Gary Owen can't cross over and he already white and been in comedy for 25 years? If what I say ain't the case. It's a cabal, it's a, it's a consortium. 
they they rock with who they rock with and they don't with who they don't. But I'm not scared of being the competition any more than you were when you lined up uh, uh, across from a superior team. Yeah, on paper, they're a better team. Right. They have all the assets and resources and we don't. But Maybe let us get on the line, boy, boy, and see if that factors in. I, I guarantee you it won't. Wow. Because Shannon Sharp got to be a different person than that other person. Absolutely. And he always was. That doesn't change when I change teams. That remains the same. That's how a legacy is built. So all of these shortcut takers, I, I was, they canceled me for talking about Harvey Weinstein before the thing came out, but he offered to suck my penis in front of all my people at my agency. What am I supposed to do? He did all of that. I'm thinking I'm the only black person on the script. I get there, it's three other black guys on there. Woo. Huh. So you wonder what they did to get <laughs> I told him no. What y'all do? <laughs> <laughs> and this is why when I walk in a room, heads go down. Can you imagine? Behind my back, I'm nothing. I'm just a regular old comedian that's bitter and jealous. But in my face, no, no, no. The king has walked in and they have to respect it only because I've not taken the shortcuts. I've not been funded. They pay you to not talk about things they don't want you to talk about. They tell you that themselves. Man. I can't do Literally, that because I. Uh, Steve told you that he stopped doing stand up because he has seven TV shows. The only problem is when he stopped stand up, he didn't have those seven TV shows. He stopped stand up because he got in a comedy battle called the Championship of Stand Up Comedy with one Cat Williams in Detroit in front of 10,000 people and lost because Cat Williams said he was actually bald and that was a wig. And I went in and that's why he couldn't do stand up anymore. Imagine him coming to tell you another story where he got so big and it was Bernie and them's fault because they wanted to be movie stars. You got to watch it. <laughs> he goes in on that's just a little bit, but you know, we don't want to make the audience watch that much of it. But uh, as you can see, just of no course, coming at it, coming at it from a, a bit of an you know, egoic perspective and he's just a flawed human, just like all of us. But, uh, the things that he's speaking on is, is pretty crazy. It's huge to be saying those things publicly because I mean, he even says like, they pay you to not talk about these things in times past. Like you would never give away Hollywood secrets like that on a huge podcast or you'd get, you get offed that quick. And this is what I meant when I said on our last episode that the great awakening is really also like the great reckoning, yep. meaning all the darkness got to come to light. This is humanity's shadow work time. And so all the lies, all the deception, all the thievery, everything behind the curtain has to be unveiled and brought into the light to be seen just like our own shadows do. So we can finally heal it and move on. And so that's why we're seeing this Epstein stuff, the Cat Williams interview, like there are so many podcasts and interviews and videos coming out in the last six months where people are just dishing out all the secrets that have been untouchable secrets in the past, like they're like nonchalant, like cats doing. And again, I just pay attention to those things in terms of our collective awakening of, Hey, there's less and less fear amongst people to come out with the truth, which means the balance of energy is shifting towards the light. And the more that it does, the more that will come out, right? The darkness only stays in darkness while the veil is covering it. And as we're awakening, we're lifting that veil. And so we're all going to get to peer into that, <clears throat> down that scary tunnel and see what's been hiding in there. And that will actually contribute massively to our collective ascension. Because when, we, when we're forced to acknowledge things like the massive highway of underground tunnels, where the government and God knows what other institutions and secret cults are using those tunnels to traffic children, run drugs. Like these are things that like, we all know it, but there hasn't been like real tangible proof that's come out yet in a public way to where we can point out and say, okay, now we're going to start an investigation. These things are still, they're, they're clinging, like you said, to hang on to those secrets and they're white knuckle gripping dude. And they're losing that grip quick and it's making them nervous, which is why they get more and more desperate. So Again, all the, all these things, these dynamics we're watching happen in real time right now 
are huge positives for where we're headed. I'm super, super optimistic about it, but it doesn't mean that we're not going to have to face up to a whole lot of dark stuff that's going to be yeah. uncomfortable for a while. Yep. Yeah, we're we're in that that deep shadow work. That video has 41 million views in 7 41? days. 41 41 million in 7 days. And that's not counting any of like the snippets that they chopped yeah. up that each have like over 10 million and then uh all of the reaction videos. Like if you just search Cat Williams right now, you'll see like big podcasts other podcasts like as big as like andrew schultz at that level mm -hmm. um if you know who that is mm -hmm. doing like reaction videos to it so like we're talking you know we're probably looking at a reach of close to 100 million which is uh just for people who aren't aware that's one third of america that's one third of america who I just mean, found out maybe for the first time yeah that the people that they look up to and have posters on their wall of yeah and such are worshiping satanic entities, lifestyles, and ways of being. So very interesting, man. 41 million people is more than one out of every 10 American citizens. Oh yeah. That means the next time you're in a store, you look around in the yep. whatever room of the store you're in, multiple people in that room have seen the video. And I've heard all those dirty secrets he just unveiled. I mean, 10 years ago, that would be impossible. It would never happen 10 years ago. No. So we're moving and if fast, man. Our age, that number's way higher. Yeah. Think about 10 years from now. What's the world going to look like? You know, we're we're moving at such a clip, it's difficult to appreciate it while you're in it. It really is, and that's why, you know, I can speak for both of us. That's why we're so passionate about this show and why we had to do this, you know, yeah. for long before the internet knew who I was. I was kind of working on this whole fourth turning thesis since about 2020. When the COVID thing happened, it was the writing on the wall uh, for this. This It confirmed that this wasn't just, uh, you know, somewhat of a my my conspiracy theories that I had been into getting the best of me. Right. It was mm -hmm. like, oh, this is actually this is actually a shift. And I am finally of age and of sound mind to really take advantage of this. And also, in a non-selfish sense, this really took my understanding of my purpose and why I'm here to a whole other level. Because my purpose of why I'm here is not to capitalize on financial markets, right? Like, cool, that's great. That's just a means to an end to help me do what I'm actually here to do during this time period. And I mean, how many times have I said the phrase for turning? <laughs> in this <laughs> even in this video like people are like stop four. saying that it's so annoying here's the thing despite how many times i've said it and will continue to say it it's still not clicking how yeah. it needs to be clicking for people like you said we are moving at an unprecedented rate right now and the the more granular details of what has to happen as this fourth turning ends in order for it to end and us to enter a first turning. I know in painstaking detail, but how many people watching this podcast can say that? And so there is that notion of like, how bad is it going to get? Or what's this going to look like? Or how do we know when things are, you know, like, like you said, imagine in 10 years, it's mm -hmm. like, Aaron, I spend all of my time thinking about that. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, let me correct that. It's a dichotomy. There's two things. I make sure to spend intentional time daily solely in the present moment. When I'm not doing that, 10 years from now. Mm -hmm. That's it. That's what I do for a living. And all of this coming out, it's not a coincidence that the political thing is happening the same time that the media is falling to podcasts and yeah. social media. The same time Hollywood is falling Crumbling. who founded hollywood all of this is connected right a lot of things are coming out the same time pharma is having issues with the covid and the vaccine and all that stuff it's all happening at the same time because it's not a coincidence at the same time the dollar is changing like you couldn't you can't make this up every domino is teetering right now and that's what has to happen because you don't go through a fourth turning into a first turning 
because like, for example, a system's media fundamentally changes, right? Like, for example, in the past, there was a time where we went from print to radio, massive life altering shifts, right? That didn't cause a fourth turning. That's just an iteration of innovation. There's been times where we went to war, World War I, World War II. Neither of those caused a fourth turning. That was just a serious bump in the road. Those landed in first turning, second turning. It depends what war we're talking about, right? None of those events. There's been, issue, there's been times when a president was assassinated. That didn't cause a fourth turning. So I just want everyone to understand the gravity of what we're talking about. This isn't saying, yeah, there's going to be a lot of change right now. No, no, no. This is saying that every single facet, for those of you who appreciated our, our rabbit hole series, if you guys remember that two-part episode we did on all of the systems of the matrix, I mean, we went into food, healthcare, politics, money, all of it. Every single system is going to fall and simultaneously be reborn. Mm -hmm. I can't think of a more intense psychedelic. <laughs> <laughs> DMT got nothing on this. Yo, reality is ayahuasca, bro. <laughs> Everything is ceremony in a sense, because you know the idea of, of ceremony is that you make a sacred space to have transformation take place in yourself. And uh, sometimes that that container doesn't feel safe on, on the medicine. You feel like you're being torn asunder left and right from all the different shadows coming up. It feels chaotic. It feels disorienting, but that's how, that's where the transformation happens is in that chaos. And so in that sense, life is ceremony, right? Cause life is always tearing apart and rebuilding. And it's like, we're like, you're saying we're moving at such an incredible pace in terms of the evolution of our society consciousness that, as we said in the last episode, it's like, get involved, play your part, be your character, whatever your soul came here to do, do that and be a positive contributor. But at the same time, it's like, yo, we all just going to stand back and watch yeah. this, this train's going by so fast. All we can do is say, whoa, you know, it's, it's just yeah. unfolding too fast to really stress too much about like, oh, I got to help. It's like, this right. is way bigger than all of us. The divine powers are already controlling and orchestrating this dissemination and crumbling of the negative polarity power structures on our planet. And it just rest assured in that faith and that trust that God's plan is already unfolding. God's will is already being accomplished. It doesn't always look like how we would plan it out. In fact, it never does, but that's why it's exciting as you're saying to live from that place of trust and surrender and say, look, God, you're already doing all this. You're already bringing darkness to light. You're already revealing truth through people like Cat Williams and all these other people we've named. You're already doing all this. So like, just use me where I need to be used. That's it. I'm not the savior. I'm not going to put the burden of saving the world on my own shoulders. God's doing all that. I'm just here to be used by God. I'm a servant of the most high. And that's an empowering attitude that one takes the stress off of you to need to save the world. It's like, it doesn't need your saving. It needs saving from you, but not by you. It needs, <laughs> it needs saving from your unconsciousness, from your greed, from your fear. So heal yourself, evolve in that sense, and know that just by virtue of working on yourself and evolving your consciousness, you are already contributing to the salvation of the world. And that's all any of us are asked to do, right? We don't need to put the burden on ourself to try and... and change something that's way bigger than us to begin with. Jeremy and I started this show just because we're like, hey, it seems to us like there's a huge void in the world right now in terms of positive news with uplifting and encouraging perspectives. So let's do a show, bro. Like, let's see where it goes. We don't know. We're just doing it to play our part. We're not married to the outcome and we don't right. need it to be anything certain, but it feels good to do what feels right. You know, and that's all we're asked to do. Beautifully said. I think that's a perfect segue for us to enter the, the final segment of the show, which is each of us going into one bold prediction for coming down the pipeline. In our first episode, we talked about our bold prediction in a more macro sense, right? We were talking more in terms of as we were entering 2024. 
going forward in our monthly episodes, we're more so going to be talking about more of a bold prediction in, in more of the near future. Mm-hmm. Not so much in the scope of a year, but also not, you know, neither of us have a crystal ball, nor do we try to time things in that sense. We could never say this is going to happen in February. Uh, it's more so just in the near future. And so over time, you're going to start to get a sense of, you know, where our minds are at and things that we're paying attention to and things that you may want to research and things that maybe you disagree with us on. That's fine. Everyone should have their own opinion as long as you've actually, you know, done your research and such. So um, uh, do you want to start us off, Aaron, or do you want me to go first? I can kick us off. Cool. What is your bold prediction? So I have two bold predictions for... The upcoming months, again, nobody can know when these things are going to happen or necessarily if they're going to happen, right? I hold it loosely. But based on the evidence we've seen and where the uh, chess pieces are being moved by the big players, it seems pretty clear that number one, we're going to see a CBDC, if not unrolled or unveiled, we're going to at least see a CBDC announced. Probably sometime by this summer, I would imagine, the whole Fed now thing. Um, That seems like a almost virtual guarantee, especially with Bitcoin about to be going off and all that. Um, But second is a a bit of a different vein is that I'm feeling more and more intuitively certain that we are going to see some kind of attempt at a, whether you call it a blackout or a cyber terrorist attack of some kind. I feel like the controllers who are seeing the power being pulled out of their hands by the day, they're going to create they need to create more chaos and pandemonium, right? To take control. And because we're leading into an election year right now, which has huge implications for them, especially, we saw what they did in 2020, especially having COVID right before the elections. They always roll some huge disaster out right before the elections to sway public opinion in the way they want. And I think in the same way, we're going to probably see some kind of cyber terrorist attack blackout, all the stuff that like Klaus Schwab, Biden, and Bill Gates keep alluding to, how they could possibly pretend to know there's going to be a global cyber attack, I don't know. But it it says to me that these are probably the next tells that we're getting. And we we even saw the Leave the World Behind movie recently on Netflix. Did you see that one? No, but people in in the LUC in my group kept posting about it. I chose not to watch it because of what was talked about, but I'm, I'm aware. Yeah. Right. I didn't watch it either, but I saw, I've seen some clips and stuff and it's literally a movie about a, a global cyber attack. Predictive, predictive programming. programming. Yeah. Just straight up predictive programming. And, um, in terms of what, th- what they're calling it is a black swan event, which is like kind of vague, but it's just a way of saying some kind of cyber attack in general. So whenever you see somebody talking about having adversaries, they're not playing for the light side. Because the light side doesn't have adversaries. (laughs) (laughs) So that's one tell. Our enemies, Russia, China, Iran, North Korea. What what do you mean our enemies? They're not my enemies. I love those people. Those are my fellow human beings. I get that they're saying, well, the government. But also, like, you know, this is why when Trump was in office, he went personally to all these country and world leaders to make peace. Because it's like, we, we have to stop having adversaries. Having adversaries is the whole problem. Because then it creates a convenient scapegoat for whatever that the controllers want to do. And so there's this thing called killware attacks that's been coming up um, in different mainstream outlets, um, World Economic Forum, this idea of a method of cyber attack that could happen. This is one example from uh, Security Magazine talking about killware, the cyber threat with physical consequences. And suddenly everyone's talking about all these different ways that technology can be weaponized against humanity. And so what they go into in this, um, in this article here is all the different ways that technology could be weaponized, like banking system attacks, power grid attacks, um, hacking into self-driving cars, airplane flights, you know, causing mass fear and pandemonium as much as possible in these different ways. And it's so it's like, you know, we have to be open to the the real possibility that just like the controllers have used everything else they can get their hands on to terrorize humanity and cause fear that they're likely going to try to use technology for the same reason. Um, The guy from Redacted that we watched earlier 
was saying that he he himself was in a Tesla for one of their shows that they did when a a hacker they they were doing this on purpose to show and demonstrate it but a hacker hacks into his Tesla while he's driving and starts taking control of the wheel and driving while he's in the driver's seat and he can't stop it and he said it was actually really scary because the guy who was doing it accidentally almost drove me into a telephone pole or a tree and it, we like narrowly missed it and drove he drove me off into a ditch and then stopped the car and I was kind of upset because it's like, yo, this was supposed to be a test run and you actually almost killed me. And he was doing that to elucidate what a real possibility this is, that these electric cars can be hacked into, da 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 So it's like, if we see electric cars being doing crazy things like driving people off the bridge, running into buildings, people, this and that, flights being controlled, to me, that'll be kind of the tell that these things are being experimented with by you know the controllers because they always they always test everything out before they do it they can't afford to try something that doesn't work right it has to work so they have to test it and that's what they did with the COVID-19 there was event 201 as you know just a few months before COVID where they ran through an entire simulation of exactly the way COVID ended up unfolding to a creepy level um, they do this with every plan right they always test it out in some way and um, interestingly enough, I think the whole Miami 10-foot-tall shadow creatures thing, <laughs> well, in my opinion, was probably the CIA or whatever organization is behind that testing out uh, these holographic technologies where they can create the illusion of an alien invasion. Um, I think that they know that disclosure is coming soon. It's inevitable. We're going to have it soon. They can't keep this a secret any longer, much longer that our governments have been in conversations with extraterrestrials uh, for a long time. And so their only option is, how do we control that information to our advantage? So let's control it by saying, hey, you're right, guys. We are talking to aliens and we got bad news. They're super evil and they want to take us over. So give us your rights. Give us your freedoms. Trust us to protect you and we'll keep you safe from the dangerous aliens. And then we'll see these fake alien invasions, attacks and whatnot. You know, Stephen Greer talks a lot about that and all the different insiders from the different Project Bluebeam and this and that who've told him directly, like, yo, I was in involved in a project where we were planning a fake alien invasion for this reason. He's had a lot of whistleblowers come to him about that kind of stuff. So it's like, I don't know any of this is going to happen for sure. I'm just trying to be as wise as a serpent in that sense and pay attention to these details of what's happening so that we can be prepared of if this does happen. Relax. It's all good. This is being staged for the reaction of fear that they want. So let's all stand together in trust and solidarity and faith that we're not going to participate in this anymore. We're not going to fall for these traps anymore. And that's the only reason why, you know, we have this segment in general, right, on our show, is we just want to raise awareness of possibilities that we ourselves are seeing slowly coming to fruition. We're not making any guarantees or absolute statements at all, but there's a whole lot of evidence leaning in these directions, at least for me personally. Yeah. So for the percentage of our audience, that's going to feel like what you just said <clears throat> is scary to them. Your main message is awareness is key in understanding that this stuff is intended to create fear and that you don't have to buy into it. Is that essentially the message? It's all illusions. It's just illusions. You don't have to be afraid of it. Because I would imagine most people would hear what you just said and be like, that's pretty, that's pretty scary. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I'm of the same, of the same thought process. And I definitely agree about the, the cyber attacks. One of the, one of the key uh, areas that, that I, I'll say that we focus on in, in the Level Up Collective, the wealth group that I run is uh, cybersecurity, because the more we're shifting to uh, what's referred to as the internet of things where everything is connected to the internet. Like soon we're going to have what's called wearables and yeah. you know, your glasses will have access to the internet. Your watch already does your phone already does, but soon clothes are going to, there's wow. going to be different plants that are going to Neuralink obviously will your car will, uh, your TV, your computer, everything else already does. It's going to be more and more like your fridge will your microwave will your oven will. So like, the more devices connected to the internet, the more cybersecurity becomes an issue, right? Surveillance. So 
no longer are we having actual wars and actual land territories yep. over oil and such like we did in the past where we're looking essentially war would always is always about money right so usually it would be to conquer because that specific territory is rich in a certain resource and then you would create a narrative so that people get behind it and are down to fight for your causes but in reality you're just trying to take the gold in that area or to take a certain uh let's say opium in that area or to take uh, gas and oil in that area or whatever now data is the new gold so mm -hmm. there won't be like going to war in you know in the middle east or whatever anymore it will be a cyber war it will be a war of narratives and a war yep. of controlling the, the ideas the narratives that i'm always talking about and um so the attacks will much more so be on other other nation for example's um information and, and data and even like hacking into their stuff and so on and so forth so yep. cyber security is a fascinating one I agree with you. I don't know when we'll see that. Uh, you know, obviously 2024 heading into the elections would be a primed time to see that, but uh, we shall see. Well, actually on that note, I forgot to mention part of the prediction is that they're going to probably do that this year because of the election. Yeah. Because they, they're going to use some kind of event to say, oh no, we need to enact martial law. Uh, China is mm. attacking us, cyber attacking us, Russia, cyber attacking us. We're under attack. So martial law, Can't have an election no election. Now. Yep. That's, that's the only strategy. Cause when you look at the poll numbers, it ain't looking good for Mr. Biden. Right. And they yeah. know that. And we know that. And so it's like, what's their plan? They're just going to let Donald Trump win fat chance. They have something so if that up happens. Sleeve, we right? go civil war for sure. Unfortunately, for sure. We go civil war. I mean, people are look at J six, like that happened in 2020. Yeah, no. If that happens, we would go civil war in this country. Yeah, in a heartbeat. And maybe they want that, right? Who knows? Yeah. Yeah. That's definitely a circulating theory that I get asked in, in my community. <laughs> what a, That's like a lot of people's base case. I would say that's a... That's definitely not my base case. Mainly because if you think in terms of chess and art of war and such, that's kind of like a kamikaze warrior. And you only do that when you have nothing, no other strategy at all. But I think they're at that point, bro. Right. So that's what I'm saying. Like, if they know what that would cause so that it'd be over anyway, that would kind of be like a, I have a bomb, let's kill us both moment. Yep. Yep. Last ditch effort, you know. So that would be interesting, but that would be them willingly relinquishing control because after that, it's all over for them as well. Yeah. Uh, so would be interesting either way it's um it will unfold exactly as it's meant to unfold it will when you look at what they're already doing with trying to get trump off the ballot yeah like they're literally sure. willing to cheat right in front of you and say we're not even going to have an election why because your candidate won't even be on the ballot yeah so it's like if they're already doing that and it's already like not working but they're already doing that why wouldn't they steal it any other way they could steal it martial law war with china cyber attack you know whatever it is they're yeah. going to do something is my hunch. Did you know one of the key characteristics when you um, when you study fourth turnings and the rise and fall of civilizations is that there is a um, non peaceful transfer of power? I think I've heard that. Yeah. Makes a lot of sense. After, after January 6th, uh, Ray Dalio, the, the largest billionaire hedge fund manager who built it from nothing, exited a lot of markets just off of seeing that just that one yeah. thing happening in society january 6th the non-peaceful transfer of power whichever side doesn't matter what actually happened doesn't matter just that aspect of once again this notion of ideas around the world if you can't get the collective hive mind to agree on the set of rules you no longer have a democracy now me and you would argue well we haven't had a democracy but let's just <laughs> Let's just, you get what I'm saying. We don't you don't have either. a society that func that can function. It's yeah. anarchy, right? It's chaos. January 6th was a, was a hint at that. If we don't see a peaceful transfer of power, there's your revolution card. So where I'm at now is we're in, this, in the second stage of, of this fourth turning, according to all my research and my personal theories, is I'm not trying to gauge, are we in the fourth turning or not, obviously. <laughs> I'm trying to gauge, is it going peaceful non-peaceful yeah which, which of these three going? outcomes is yeah so that's kind of like where i'm at with it if your outcome plays out and, and the one that i've heard you know repeatedly then that's 
that's more civil war. Uh, then the cyber one, let's say it's like, it's China. Then that's more world war. Then the third option is like I've been talking about and people get all triggered. You're, you're promoting a charlatan. It's like, no, I'm not. I've talked about how a political leader would need to come into power and unite the country. Someone like a Robert Kennedy and a Vivek that can speak to both sides. Mm -hmm. That's not because I'm not saying they don't have skeletons in their closet. That's because I'm saying it's way bigger than them, you, me, or Aaron, or what any of us think. If you can't unite 300 million people, then we're going to have big issues in this country because right now we can't agree on anything. 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 We don't even want to be in the room with someone who believes differently from us. Think about that concept. Yeah. So I think that's starting to change too. I think people are slowly where, coming together. Yeah, and I agree. And it is swinging back a little bit and it needs to, especially because the 2024 energy of these campaigns needs to be around that. Because if it isn't, that's where the, the other two outcomes play out. For sure. So I know a lot of people are so contrarian and anti-authority in the comments that they can't fathom what I'm saying being a good thing. But once again, it's not about the person. It's about the ideology. And we do, whoever it is, I don't personally care. It doesn't affect my life. But whoever's going to run the Chattel needs to be someone who can unite a nation or else the other two outcomes are going to play out. Anyway, here's mine. So my prediction isn't as scary as Aaron's. Mine is just more, I want this on the record. Uh, and this is more in my wheelhouse. Like we were talking about earlier, Bitcoin, crypto, you know, there's a lot to say. I don't, I don't, I've never taught publicly on crypto. Most of the internet probably doesn't even understand how heavily involved I am in this stuff. Obviously I've mentioned technology. I've mentioned innovation. I mentioned AI, et cetera, but you know, I don't share too much publicly. What I want to talk about for my prediction, uh, I'll get to in just a second. First, let me lay some ground, some foundational context, okay? Number one, BlackRock, State Street, and Vanguard own a combined 88% of all U.S. stocks as of 2024. I want you to try to wrap your head around that. BlackRock is expected to own 60% of all single-family U.S. real estate by 2030. I want you to wrap your head around that. It's difficult. BlackRock and a few other investment banks that run the world and the global economy way above the politicians, right? We know that if you've seen those charts, Aaron, where it's like orders of power and politicians yeah. are really like in the middle. Oh, yeah. You know, BlackRock's well above that. These are the same investment banks who are launching Bitcoin and Ethereum ETFs. We just saw Bitcoin approved. We're going to see Ethereum ETFs coming down the pipeline. You mark my words and you do with that what you will. For those that don't understand what an ETF is or how it works, think of it as a concentrated and centralized bundle of assets that you can buy and hold rather than having to manage your own asset allocation or the underlying assets themselves. Who does this appeal to? This appeals to the same people that day in and day out sacrifice their privacy and their freedom and their rights for convenience. It's the same people that will opt into biometric scans and tracking devices and whatever, giving up their personal information because it's convenient, right? That is who this appeals to. You benefit from the price action to the upside or downside, but you don't actually own the underlying asset. I talked about this in the beginning. I'm reflecting it again so it can sink in. The same way that when you put your money in a bank, that is no longer your money, right? It's the banks. And if you don't believe me, read your contracts. Read the contract. It is not your money once it's in the bank. So now let's talk about my thesis. And here's my bold prediction. My overall thesis is that BlackRock, Vanguard, Vanek, Fidelity, and a few others who are sprinting to not miss this once in a century opportunity for global wealth and power capture. Really, this is way bigger than money. This is bigger than, oh, it's a new investment product. No, it's way bigger than that. This is power. This is an opportunity where a bank in, the, in 100 years could eclipse a nation state. This is an opportunity where a Chase bank could rule a nation like Russia. 
we could no longer have a concept of states in a hundred years. I know you can't think that far because you don't study history like that. But this nation of state or this notion of states, this notion of countries, not that old. Yeah. Not that old. And it won't last forever. It won't, especially as things are shifting to globalization. So in the future, what will power dynamics look like? Will they look like Russia, China, US, rah, rah, rah? Skynet. Or will they look like aggregation of wealth and agreed upon ideologies grouped? Mm -hmm. And they'll have different names. And who? what's going to dictate who holds and controls those aggregations of wealth? In my opinion, it's going to be who owns the most Bitcoin, who owns the most digital money. So here's where I'm going with this. These investment banks are sprinting right now, frantically, to not miss this once in, a, once in a century opportunity for global wealth and power capture so that they can swallow up as much of the global cryptocurrency supply. They're specifically focused on Bitcoin and Ethereum. But in the future, we will likely see a multi-chain world. I'm very positive of that. But the institutions are going to start slow because you don't just ape into a shit coin when you have a few trillion in assets under management. You just <laughs> don't do that, right? You move like a dinosaur. But eventually, they'll come around. And here is their plan and my prediction. They're about to create what's referred to as a supply shock in the market. Bitcoin is about to have again in April. Another four years from that, it's going to have again. Soon, all of the Bitcoin ever created will be in circulation and someone will own it. I'm going to say that a different way. You won't even be able to buy it on Coinbase. You won't even be able to buy it on Crypto.com. You will have to buy it from someone else. Who's going to sell it to you? Who's going to want to give theirs up? So what are the other options? Well, BlackRock's going to own... <laughs> 20% of all of it in circulation, okay, they're going to lease it to you now. And the same way they lease it to you, there's going to be contracts involved with that. There's going to be terms. There's going to be implied contracts in there too. There's going to be consent implied in there too. If you're a bad little boy and girl, the same way your real estate is turned off that BlackRock owns and rents to you, your account, the same way. Because you don't own that. The phrase in crypto is not your keys, not your crypto. In other words, if you don't own it in your own personal hardware, cold wallet, it's not yours. Mm -hmm. So this is the world that we're shifting into. And so when I talk about global wealth transfers, everyone thinks they understand what that means. But it doesn't mean what it used to mean where we were just like, oh, okay, that means people are going to get rich. The rich are going to get rich. It's a little more complex than that. We've never had a wealth transfer that involved AI and digital money. It's never existed before. The wealth transfers in the past was like the Spaniards coming over here or Christopher Columbus raping and pillaging and taking the, you know, the commodities from the ground that the Native Americans had or invading a nation and taking their oil or, you know, living standards in a certain uh, nation or a certain state massively rising and productivity going up and, you know, innovation being spurred through that. That was the past wealth transfers. This wealth transfer is like, it's one that we haven't seen. We've never seen something like this. Never. So that means that no one can possibly forecast the, the full implications of this on a long enough time period. And when you look at someone like Michael Saylor, <laughs> who's out here about to own 1% of all of the Bitcoin in circulation. In a 20 year time period, this might be the wealthiest man on the globe, in the entire earth. He could very well eclipse Elon, just off of holding an asset, not even off of his company, MicroStrategy. So to me, the shift now that the old system is crumbling and they know that, is all right, we have to get on board. We have to get first mover advantage. They don't have first mover advantage over me and you, Aaron, but first mover advantage in, with the big boys, right? We're not out here owning billions in assets under management. 
They need first mover advantage with these ETF products. They need to scoop up as much as they can in the beginning. Because if they wait, let's say they're like, oh, we'll ease in over the next five years. It's risky. You're going to buy it at $100,000. You're going to buy it at $200,000 or you're not going to buy it at all. It's not going to be available for you. So they can't risk that. They cannot. I'm letting you guys know right now. I'm giving you so much free sauce that you will not find on the internet <laughs> if you can read in between the lines of what I'm saying. We're heading into a world where no one will have ownership or true control over anything. We know that's true when you wake up to the straw man. We know that's true when you wake up to your mortgage deed. We know that's true when you wake up to your driver's license and all of these things. But we're going to be shifting into a space where here is the wealth transfer right now. You have a digital scarce asset that has the potential for the first time in the history of money, I'll say of uh, new world money before we were using, you know, weird forms of value representation that you can actually own what you have. You can actually own that money. And there's going to be a very, very, very small 1%. Imagine that number, Aaron. <laughs> it's going to be a different 1% now. You know who it is? It's the people that actually have the keys to their crypto. Mm -hmm. And then there's going to be a 99%. And that's going to be those that are accepting privileges, handouts, universal basic income, their jobs being taken by AI, and they own Bitcoin ETFs. Their house is rented from BlackRock. <laughs> their food <laughs> is farmed and made from Bill Gates. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, boy. Their, and their assets, their assets aren't even theirs. They're leasing their car. They're leasing their Bitcoin. They're renting their house. Damn near living in a simulation. You don't have anything except your soul. So it's an interesting, it's an interesting world that we're heading into. And so when I talk about wealth transfer, I'm really talking about something way bigger than, oh, money's going from here to here. No, no, no. This is, this is bigger. This is a larger idea. So my message, I guess, is twofold. Number one, do not be a sheep. These products are not for any intelligent person. And anyone who knows anything about crypto should know that if you're willing to sacrifice your convenience, sorry, sacrifice your privacy and your rights, understand what you're trading for your convenience. I understand it's very easy to just, oh, I'll just buy a Bitcoin ETF. Oh, but Jeremy, my retirement account, I have to just switch over or I'll have to pay taxes on it. There's solutions to that. We provide the solutions to that in the Level Up Collective. We walk people through how to get out of the system and not have to deal with the implications of what usually comes with it. But we have a, a, a nation of people, Aaron, who have participated in the rat race and been plugged into 401ks, 403bs, Roth IRAs, and SEP IRAs who are sitting here going, yes, finally I can transfer my IRA into the Bitcoin ETF. Isn't that a win, Jeremy? It's better than nothing. That is where I'm talking about. The wealthy think in decades and centuries. You're thinking in terms of, oh, price go up. I'll be richer in three years at the expense of what the next hundred years is going to look like for your family. I'm telling you that if we use this form of digital money on this planet for a few hundred years, it's only going to be a decade or less before there is no more in circulation. So what are your kids going to do? What are your kids' kids going to do? If you're my age, what are you going to do when you're more middle age? So to me, people are being, you know, funneled in. And once again, look, I'm benefiting from this. Normally, people don't come on the Internet and tell you not to do things that are going to benefit them financially. I'm telling you, either way, I'm good, though. I don't want this for our people. And for all of you who participate in retirement accounts and the whole work a job thing and funnel away, oh, but Jeremy, it's great. My employer will match it. Yeah. You ever ask yourself why? Why? Why are they willing to match that? You must be getting the losing end of the stick if they're willing to do that. Mm -hmm. All of these retirement accounts that are going to shift into Bitcoin and everything like that, it's the same shit. It's a wealth transfer. So you're giving your life force to this employer. You don't own your house. And even if you own, think you own it, you don't. And the rest of it is going to be controlled by BlackRock. So this is your one chance, my friend, as I wrap this up. This is your one chance to actually have real control 
over the underlying form of store of value, transfer of value, and sound money of the next 100, 120 year long system, according to the fourth turning theory. The U.S. fiat dollar started in 1913. It's 2024. That's 111 years. 111. Imagine that. It's a sign. <laughs> <laughs> what is the next 120 year cycle going to look like? That's the question to be asking yourself. And while the ETF is amazing for price action for people that own the underlying thing, if you don't own the underlying thing, you now have to run through a lot of game theory where you calculate, okay, if I buy now, this is not good prices to buy at. If I buy later, it could be even higher. And I could sit on the sidelines waiting, 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 like people have done since Bitcoin touched 16K and I was screaming to buy it. People didn't listen. Now we're up well over 100%. We're just getting started. All I'm saying is expand your time horizon. I'm telling you right now, and this is going to age so, so well, which is why I wanted this to be out there. We're going to use this clip in the future. <laughs> this is what is going to happen. This is what I spend my life researching. And I'm very confident in my prediction. I'm not saying this is going to happen in February, March, or April. I'm just letting you know what's coming. And, uh, you know, there's a difference between owning something. Oh, wow, it went up. I'm selling. And thinking in terms of real wealth. These families, they don't sell. They control. I'm going to say that again. They don't sell. They acquire and control. How can BlackRock own 60% of the all of the real estate in America by 2030 if they fix and flip? They control. What do I do for a living? Study the 1%, model them. If the 1% aren't selling, why are you? If the 1% aren't trading, why do you think that's how you're going to get wealthy? It is a land grab similar to when Christopher Columbus came over here and discovered there were already people here. The history is a little, told to us a little different, but there were already moors on this land. And we weren't told about that history. Well, we're experiencing the second land grab of that opportunity, except it's not a land grab on the globe because the, well, I, <laughs> we're going to have flat, flat earthers in the comments. <laughs> Don't piss off the flat earthers, bro. Hey, just we'll bear with me. Just, just it. pretend it's a globe, okay? We no longer have space on the globe to conquer, right? We have different jurisdictions, territories, countries, states, etc. So what's next? Well, jurisdiction, if you've ever heard of this book called The Sovereign Individual, excellent book, highly recommend for everyone. It's not about sovereignty. This is about everything I'm talking about right now. Actually, it kind of relates. The new jurisdictions are going to be in cyberspace. And right. we're talking about this idea of who owns the most of this underlying idea. There are There is no longer land to conquer. There is no longer land to own, to say, oh, I own all of this square footage in Russia, so I have this much power. The next iteration of that is digital. I own all of this stored energy. That's what you can think of it as, stored collective thought. That's power the next 100 years. I just gave you the playbook. Do with it what you will. That's my prediction, Aaron. I think it's a good one. I think it's a likely one. And I'm definitely with you on all of the, uh, the way you laid that out. And one last question for you is what would happen if everybody started mimicking the 1% to the, to the sense that like everything that the whales do, all the people do too? And that, yeah. would, that would take away all their ability to manipulate, right? That's a funny question. So I'm a adamant believer that everything in life is a bell curve. There's a lot of memes. Have you ever seen any of those memes where it's a bell curve and there's like a ridiculous looking person on one side, a Jedi on the other side, and then in the middle, it's like a third picture. Have you ever seen any of this? I think so. Okay. So it's 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 a known thing, in, at least in crypto Twitter. Um, it's literally referred to as the bell curve meme about like if you're super high IQ, you're on the one side super low IQ, like the person's like drooling out of their mouth <laughs> on the on the low IQ side. And then in the middle is like the masses, right? Normies, most of society. So the people in the middle are the people that, for example, were pro-stimulus, 
pro vaccine for right so right. that's the the bulk of society so everyone runs the one percent playbook you're still now you're going to have everyone doing the same thing and you're just going to have a new bell curve if that yeah. makes sense because it, it comes back to like what jordan peterson almost you know they tried to cancel him for on that new show where he's talking about hierarchies naturally form in yeah all of the animal kingdom, the plant kingdom, and humans are no different. And, you know, oh, you're a misogynist, you're sexist. No, this is just the nature of, you know, reality on this, in this plane, at least. So, yeah, that's kind of how I view this is just, okay, we all do the 1% playbook. Well, not everyone is equally skilled. Not everyone has the same level of intellect. Not everyone has the same level of emotional intelligence, soft skills. Mm -hmm. Not everyone has the same access to resources and all that, right? So, okay, everyone's trying to do the 1% playbook, then it comes down to information asymmetry. Who has the most thorough information in the quickest amount of time and is able to distill that information down and reverse engineer it correctly into investment thesis? That is the game, right? So like when I was bridging the gap from being your average retail investor on Robinhood, you know, trying to compete with the big boys and, you know, trading options and such and getting my ass handed to me, more often than not, but, you know, winning sometimes bridging the gap from that, which is like most people who think they're an investor. That's literally what they do, right? They're on Robin hood and they think that they're an investor going from that to like, actually like using institutional, um, number one paid institutional resources that we, you know, teach and offer in the LUC number two, like conducting research at the level that the institute institutions do, and then crafting, you know, a base case, a bear case, a bull case, and all this type of stuff studying across industries as well because you can't just study let's say uh this one area let's say uh si a specific cybersecurity stock you can't just stu study cybersecurity you have to also understand the financial security you have to also understand every touch point of that supply chain that involves the cybersecurity right so you have to understand fedex and trucking you have to understand inflation you have to understand the chip company that's working on all that you have to understand every piece of it so you have to actually understand all of it well, what I just said probably sounds like a doozy because <laughs> it is. There's a lot that goes into it. This is the level that institutional money researches things and the level of uh, access that they have to information that's yeah. hidden. It's hidden, number one, you've just never heard of it. And number two, it's hidden behind paywalls. This isn't free. You can't find it on Google. It's hidden institutional research. And so coming across these types of things gives me an information asymmetry in the markets against your average middle of the bell curve who thinks they know how to invest because they've owned Apple and Microsoft and it's went up a lot. That says nothing about you. That says everything about our fiat based Ponzi scheme of an economy. The government printed more money. That's why you made money. No other reason. <laughs> Versus, you know, I put in, you know, a hundred hours of research and I found this anomaly, created a thesis, bull case, base case, bear case, invested in it, risk reward weighted it, and my thesis played out. Okay, that's a different story. That's a whole other level versus like I threw some money in Amazon and it's up. I'm a genius. I got lucky. Right? Yeah. And so that's that. And that's where I started too. But my point is just like, I'm walking you through just a sliver, a sliver of what goes into what I do and, and, and full transparency, like I am a forever student of the game. By no means do I think I um, am, you know, excellent or am a whale or anything like that. I'm always learning. But my point is just like, I just touch on just a few things that go into being exceptional when it comes to the games that the one percent are playing. And, you know, I'll spend the next few decades trying to be a fraction of as competent as you know, these, the 1% are because, you know, wealth, we always talk about wealth affords you resources and such. Like I don't have a quantum computer. I don't have a team of 200 analysts working full time. That's what I was just going to say. Traveling to every single company and conducting in-depth research mm -hmm. that's private. They have access to everything behind the curtain. Every step of the supply chain, they have all the numbers on that. So the way that they see investing is fundamentally very similar to like Neo in the Matrix versus Neo before he plugged into the Matrix. Mm -hmm. They're seeing an entirely different world. The average normie in the middle of that bell curve 
sees charts going up and charts going down and they go, oh, bye. Oh, I'm good. It went up. That's what they see. They see price action. Yeah. That's the end result of someone else's thesis. That's the end result of an idea. So uh, like real investors, like higher level investors are focused on skating to where the puck is going to be. And that's a real skill, you know, like being there three years early. That's a real skill. Being there five years early. That's a real skill. Usually you don't want to be there five years early. You got to have a lot of money to burn. You know what I mean? You're sitting there for five years. You're burning cash. (laughs) Oh, they do. Depends. But maybe you want to start being there here five years early and you start being there here 18 months early. It depends. But this is the game that I play. I learned a lot last crypto bear market and bull run. And um, this round, the beginning of what we're about to experience, we'll see, has played out flawlessly because of all that I've learned the last three years, which has been brutal. Um, And I was in, I've been in crypto longer than that, but the three years I'm referencing is, you know, we had a little over a two year bear market and then we had a a year-ish of hysteria in the the bull market and such. So yeah, man, it's fascinating stuff. Uh, But to conclude, we should all try to model the 1%, but that's not the same as saying we are the 1%, right? That's where it comes down to education, personal development, spiritual development, emotional development, nervous system regulation, hiring the right mentors, being in the right environments, finding access to that information asymmetry that I'm talking about because people don't give this shit out, right? I had to work with high level people to learn, holy shit, this exists. You could just see what the whales are buying like day to day. That's like cheating. Well, you're not going to find that on Google. So it's kind of unfair when you learn about the financial industry. (laughs) No, it's like they're using, they're using tools that you just, well, I know we all know it's unfair in terms of the literal outright fraud and corruption, but, but I'm referencing just the the information asymmetry. Mm -hmm. Like the average person goes, Ooh, Apple headline from the New York times. I'm going to (laughs) buy. And it's like BlackRock funded that piece of paper because they just finished their 19 month longitudinal study. Yeah. They bought their bags at the low and now they need you to pump it so they can take profits before this quarter's over so they can appease investors in the shareholder meeting. Yeah. (laughs) That's the bell curve. (laughs) By By the time you get a headline, the whales have already gotten in position and funded the headline for you to oh, be yeah. like, oh, I'm going to go buy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, fu- it's, it's funny, man. But yeah, we could go on all day with that. Uh, we're sitting at a little over three hour episode. This one was juicy. Dude, you just dropped an investment masterclass on us right there. Yeah, I didn't mean to. <laughs> He's like, I, <laughs> I won't apologize. I didn't mean to, but uh, for those that uh, it has come to my awareness recently, especially as we're doing more of this show, because me and you riff on so many different things. I, uh, I don't normally go like very deep into the financial stuff. Yeah. And so like, I've been in kind of the, I've been in the shadows the last two years about that. Like, I don't, I even, if you notice my content and stuff, like I don't teach much, like I'm not dropping reels on stocks or like crypto research, like that's behind the scenes. And so one thing I'm, I'm working on shifting, and this is the first, I guess the first taste of that for the audience is, um, that is like that's my bread and butter. I can speak on a lot of things, but this is how I've built wealth. And 18 months ago, if I'm putting this out in content, people aren't going to watch it. We're in a recession. Like I said, the bell curve meme price go down, not interested price go up. I buy that's the, that's the mid mid level IQ, right? So if I was putting this out 24 months ago, 18 months ago, 12 months ago, people don't care. They're not interested. Right. If I put out like doom and gloom recession content, they'll watch it. But if I put out about how you need to buy and how innovation and the behind the scenes analytic and the research that I'm doing, people are like, I don't believe them. Yeah. Because they haven't seen it with their two eyes. And that's how I make my money. Right. Because I believe me and guess how long I've been in. So that's how that works. Right. But now that we're starting to enter a bull market, we're going to start to have a lot more people. I guess we'll gauge it based on the comment section of this, for example. (laughs) But we're going to likely have a lot more people who are interested in trying to now start learning of these types of things. And so 
yeah, I guess I just wanted to um, give a little bit of sauce there because we're normally just talking about like sovereignty and spirituality yeah. and all that. But uh, this is a big passion of mine for sure. Yeah. Well, thank you for dropping the sauce, bro, because this is an area that is, it's truly rocket science for most people, myself included. You have to be all in doing this kind of research. And even when you said, you know, the 1%, I want to just be a fraction of as informed as the 1% are, or however you said it. I think in some regards, in terms of like the actual individuals who own companies, you might be more informed than them in the sense that they're just paying 200 plus people to do nonstop research for them and then tell them what the data is. They're not actually sitting all day on a computer doing that research themselves. So yeah. I think you, you probably are individually more um, aware and tapped into these things than many of the 1% who are just kind of sitting on the Bahamas, sipping their martini, getting the call from whatever employee for whatever thing they need. Um, if we're going to shift this tectonic imbalance of wealth, it has to begin with people like you and I getting empowered with knowledge of how this game works and how we can play the game like the 1% to begin yeah. shifting that wealth back into the people's hands so that it doesn't keep going down this kind of dark road of multinational corporations owning everything. None of us want that future reality where, you know, we're living in the Terminator where Skynet's ruling over us and stuff. So we need to be able to shift the balance of power naturally by learning how to play the game, learning how they play the game so we don't fall into their money traps any longer. And we can make informed, empowered decisions with our money and accumulate generational wealth. And we're not giving financial advice, y'all. But if y'all miss out on this Bitcoin bull run, don't say we didn't tell you so. Yeah. Yeah, of course, none of this is financial advice. This is all for entertainment and education purposes only. Very good. But um, <laughs> yeah, it, it, it is unfortunate to see like, and I think this is something we're both passionate about kind of shifting, but I do uh, expect and anticipate and appreciate resistance here, which is like, there's this virus in the spiritual community where so many of us have just put our head in the sand and we're like, oh, that's corrupt. I don't participate. Mm-hmm. And once again, as I'm always saying, and as Aaron just said, things aren't going to shift if you just don't participate. Yeah. Because guess what? Wealth is going to be continued, continually increasing globally as productivity increases globally. The economy is going to go on and it's going to put wealth in the pockets of someone. And if you're not participating it because you're holier than thou, then you're going to continue struggling for money and sacrificing your morals and your values when times get tough because you don't have leverage. Money affords you leverage. Mm -hmm. If you want to play chess at a high level, you need money to say, fuck you when they try to put something in your arm. You can't do that if they feed your family, can you? Mm -hmm. Money is important. And so, of course, I'm already anticipating a lot of people in the comments. And no, I'm not saying fuck you to anyone. I know that was an egoic <laughs> moment. It was just to be a little bit uh, grandiose with my explanation. But I'm already anticipating people in the comments like, you know, oh, that was so informative, but I'm not participating in that. To each their own. Mm -hmm. All I'm saying is I would sit long and hard with where's that coming from? Is that right. coming from a from a pure place? Is that coming from your higher self or is that coming from some of your spiritual identity you've picked up? Because the God I know, Aaron, wants me and literally has forced me <laughs> into this position. <laughs> I never wanted to be what I am right now. I resisted it, to be honest. I was forced to become wealthy. I resisted it, to be honest. I was just like a lot of you guys in the comment section. I don't want to be wealthy. I'm better than that. <laughs> Money's bad. I'm better than those people. <laughs> and then I grew up. I grew up and I started to realize, damn, this is the way change works on this planet. If we were on Mars, maybe it's different. If we were on some far-fetched planet in a diff distant galaxy, maybe it's different. But on this planet, that's how that works. Mm-hmm. So I'm all about don't hate the play, I hate the game. And once you learn the rules to the game, play the game. So once I kind of figured that out, I just dedicated myself to it. 
it's been a long time of, of, you know, learning this stuff and I'm always learning, but that's kind of like my driving. Why is just, if I don't do it, I'm going to continue on being broke. They're going to continue on being more and more wealthy. And then I'm going to sit here and continue to complain about the rules they're making for the society I have to live in. What sense does that make? If you acquire more wealth via some of these vehicles we're talking about, these are excellent investment vehicles because your average person isn't going to be able to build and scale a multi-million dollar business. Not everyone is me and Aaron. This is a real opportunity, whether you're on the left of the bell curve and you got two knots on your head or you're in the middle of the bell curve. This is a real opportunity for the average person yeah. to set themselves up and their family up generationally. So I'll stop there. No yeah. shortage of passion. None. Brother. And this is probably going to become a recurring theme this year, right? It's going to be a lot about the financial markets and a lot about the political because those two are so interconnected and there's a lot going on right now in terms of all that. Yeah, it's all interconnected. I'll close with this. I'll give this piece of feedback to the listener as well. There was somebody who commented on our last video, Jeremy, about, um, I think I made a comment about it isn't spiritual or enlightened to just bury your head in the sand, say, I'm so afraid or I'm so angry about what's happening. I'm moving to Costa Rica and just going off grid. <laughs> like you're yeah. not actually helping humanity. When you do that, you're, it's escapism, right? And somebody said, well, how do you know it's always escapism? What if I have a good reason for moving to Costa Rica? And of course, we're not saying anything is inherently a good or bad action. Actions don't mean anything other than the intention behind them. So someone may very well have a great reason to go move off grid that's going to actually benefit humanity. And yes, somebody could, hypothetically speaking, go live in a jungle and meditate, raise their consciousness and benefit humanity just from that. Of course, that's valid. But that's... Uh, enormous rarity and an exception, not the norm, right? Most of us aren't, our souls didn't incarnate here to go hide in a jungle and meditate and help humanity that way. Most of our souls said, I have lots of lessons to learn. I need to learn empowerment. I need to learn self-trust. I need to learn trusting in God. So I'm going to go into a planet in a very difficult lifetime where I can be of service to an, a struggling planet. And what we're saying here is you're only going to find your true soul's fulfillment by doing that. And it may, it may be something like what Jeremy's doing, right? Maybe you're passionate about financial markets and stocks and investments, and you can help empower humanity that way. There's an infinite amount of ways that you can help, but always take it back to your inner guidance and your conscience, right? This is how you will not stray off of your soul's path. If I'm walking down the street, Jeremy, and I see an old lady about to get mugged, is it loving or enlightened of me to say, oh, I see a scary thing happening. Let me just ignore that because I'm spiritual. I don't want to participate in the theft. We would all say, of course not, right? That's very selfish of you. So in the same way, that's an extreme example, but I'm going to extrapolate that example to everything because everything is just like that. We live in a moral universe. The universe is literally nothing but a morality test at this level of consciousness. How are you going to respond to the moral things or immoral things happening around you? And every single one of them is a litmus test of your level of consciousness. So what you're not aware of can't be held against you to a large extent. There's always karmic responsibility. But like if you're not aware that the jab was a poisonous bioweapon, then you can't be blamed in any way for taking it. But if you were aware that it was and still took it, that'd be weird, right? The, those of us who didn't take it, it's because we knew that's what it was. So in that same sense, if you understand how the markets work, if you understand how the whales manipulate markets to their advantage to take money out of the people's hands and into their hands, if you understand the way the medical industry propagandizes the country through the media, through commercials, blah, 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 and you don't take at least some sort of relationship to it that benefits the positive change in that area, then that's a form of bypassing in any way you do that. All you have to do is, again, check in with your inner guidance and say, okay, God, I've recently become aware that the medical system in America that I thought was good and righteous and helpful is actually, unfortunately, extremely corrupt, profit-based, and not concerned with health, but only with money. And millions of people are dying and suffering because of that greed. Now I'm aware of that. Please, God, just show me how to participate in that system in a beneficial way for humanity. 
I just want to help humanity move in the right direction. And so that may just look like don't participate in that system anymore. That's it. Like you don't have to do these great grandiose things. That's not what we're saying. We're saying, take the awareness that the universe is giving you about the actual reality that you live in. None of us want it to be true that the medical system is corrupt. We all wish that it wasn't, of course. But to pretend it's not, isn't reality. You're, you're not living in reality. And where reality is, is where happiness is. When you can accept what's true, rather than fight or ignore what's true because it's inconvenient or it's uncomfortable, if you can accept it, that's where freedom begins. That's where healing begins. That's where happiness begins. And I promise you guys, like, like Jeremy said earlier, yeah, we're aware of all these dark systems in the world and the corruption that's going on. And guess what? We live incredibly happy lives. It, we don't live in fear. We don't live cowering under our bed, shaking and shivering in fear. It's very much the opposite. With, with true knowledge comes true empowerment. And with empowerment comes peace of mind. The more you're aware of and you take a positive karmic relationship to, the happier your life will be. And most of you are unhappy in large part because you're entangled in all these negative karmic relationships with the banks, with the health industry, with the government, with the corporations, this and that. You're not taking responsibility for what you're participating in because maybe subconsciously you kind of know something's off. It doesn't feel right. It doesn't feel fair. Something's amiss here. But that's kind of uncomfortable to acknowledge. So let's just move on and act like everything's fine. That's just the karmic consequence of living that way. You're going to attract negative karma. You're going to get entrapped in these systems like the vaccine, like the CBDC, like whatever else is coming next. And you can avoid all of it and be sovereign and free. And as Jeremy said earlier, none of that stuff affects me anymore because I don't participate because I took responsibility for my awareness of it and acted accordingly. It's like, just do the next right thing. The universe makes you aware of something because it's asking you to take a righteous relationship to that thing. And if each one of us does that on an individual level, the gravity of the planet starts shifting dramatically towards the positive as each one of us do that, right? So that's what this show is about. That's why we're here to inform, to educate, to uplift, to encourage, and to empower our listeners to say, we're living in the greatest time of human history. We truly are. This is the great awakening. There's no more exciting time to be alive. There's no more opportunistic time to be alive. And your soul came here for this, right? So why not play the game that you came here to play? Wow. What a mic drop of an ending. Another closer. We're, <laughs> we're going we're gonna to leave it at that. Thank you guys so much. For those of you who are still tuning in with us, we'd love to hear uh, your biggest piece of feedback on today's episode what did you like what didn't you like what's coming up for you and um we can't wait to uh continue doing this every episode me and aaron have a blast doing this so happy february that's when you guys will be watching this we can't wait to see you again in march and uh have no clue what's gonna <laughs> what's coming down the pipeline but we can be certain that it's going to be super interesting and that uh we'll do our best to give non- fear-based takes on it and keep you guys in the know. So thanks so much for tuning in. We wish you all peace and love. See you guys next time.